acting lecturer for today. He's an academic, opinion columnist, and media pundit, as well as policy advisor, focusing on the Asia-Pacific region. As an academic, he has taught as political science professor at the Ateneo de Manila University and De La Salle University, and most recently was a research fellow at the National Zhengzhi University in Taiwan, and has delivered lectures and talks um, at the world's leading universities, including Columbia University, Stanford University, Harvard University, Johns Hopkins University, Leiden University, the Australian National University, and the National University of Singapore. As an advisor, he has provided consultancy to top government officials, presidential candidates, civil society groups, as well as investment groups, including Deutsche Bank, Morgan Stanley, and Goldman Sachs. He's a regular opinion writer for Al Jazeera English, The Straits Times, Nikkei Asian Review, South China Morning Post, Forbes, and a columnist for the Philippine Daily Inquirer, the Philippines' leading newspaper. He's currently a non-resident fellow at Stratbase ADR Institute, a resident political analyst for GMA Network, where he is also the co-host of the show Stand for Truth, and previously resident foreign affairs analyst for the ABS-CBN News Channel. He's a regular contributor to the Center for Strategic and International Studies and the Council on Foreign Relations, and frequently contributes to other leading think tanks across the world. He was awarded as the 10 Outstanding Young Men in the Philippines in 2016, as well as 10 Outstanding Young Persons of the World in 2018 for his contributions to social sciences and public education. As one of the most prominent strategic thinkers in the region, author of several books and more than 8,000 articles and columns, he has been described by Professor Walden Belli of State University of New York as one of Asia's most prolific young analysts, while the Manila Bulletin the Philippines' oldest newspaper has described him as among the country's foremost foreign affairs and economic analysts. Standard, Stanford University Freeman's Pauli Institute has described him as the most prolific and interviewed geopolitical analyst, currently writing and speaking not only in the Philippines, but arguably in Southeast Asia as well. To give the floor to our special visiting lecturer, I want to introduce to you and please welcome him a round of virtual applause, um, Sir Richard Hidarian, to begin his lecture, Caught in Between Empires, Philippine Strategic History from the Philippine Revolution to the End of Commonwealth. Good afternoon, Sir Richard. Good afternoon, Post. Maram Salamat. Can you hear me? Uh, claro po ba yung uh, post is ko? Yes, sir. Uh, possible, may uh, share my PowerPoint? Uh-uh. Thank you very much. Uh, so I think even if you're the most entertaining uh, speaker, and I'm not going to claim to be that, medyo mahirap pag walang visual aid. So I felt uh, making a PowerPoint would be very helpful uh, in that sense position. Uh, um, yeah, and thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Although I would say that the introduction is a little bit uh, dated. I think since the pandemic, I added another thousand articles to <laughs> my uh, list uh, because of so many things happening. So as you may guess, especially with the elections right now and me trying out even TikTok and other social media to reach out to the younger generations, may just sabaw na po tayo. But uh, I will try in the next uh, hour or two uh, to scratch the surface because I will definitely not claim to be a historian in, in any serious sense of the word, right? Uh, I'm barely even the student of history, although history was always close to my heart. Uh, at a very young age, seven, eight year old, my dad would uh, let me listen to BBC News. Uh, so, Gulf War palang onwards. At a very young age, habang siguro Mickey Mouse, Minnie Mouse, ang pinapakinggan or ano yung mga ibang tao. Uh, ako, yung mga geopolitics via BBC. Uh, yun ang aking exposure. So, this thing has been running in my blood. But of course, my training is in social sciences and political science. Uh, although I slightly did medical sciences before I went into social sciences. So, so definitely I'm not approaching this as a historian. I'm approaching this from an international relations theory point of view. But uh, thankfully for you guys, I'm not going to talk about IR theory. Don't worry about that. Uh, we're not going to go into that. So we're going to have an historical approach. And just to be uh, honest, my really approach to this is, uh, you know, people I really admire, people like Benedict Anderson, kind of like global history approach. That's the approach. Uh, that I'm going to take in terms of understanding the Philippines. So, marami tayong makikita dito, and in the succeeding lecture, so there are three lectures here, I'm going to cover five major strategic junctures in Philippine history. So in this lecture, you'll see a lot of global politics. So we're going to contextualize what happens in the Philippines, 
what happens dun sa ating strategic uh, culture at saka yung uh, interaction natin with the world within a broader context. So I think that's where hopefully I can make a contribution to the literature. And I really want to thank Sir Raul no, for, for inviting me again to be part of this uh, visiting lectureship program because sa, sa totoo lang, uh, it pushes me to learn more and more, uh, especially uh, ukul sa ating sariling bansa at ating kasaysayan. So actually nakaka-excite ito. I just hope hindi tayo gano ka busy with the elections time and the twisted plot, not plot twist. But I'm I'm still gonna do my best, hopefully, uh, to cover I think the the at least the basics, uh, yung ground ng ating politics. Um, let me also add that, of course, this year I have been the professorial lecturer uh, with PUP, and uh, in a way, my book uh, on China, uh, my new book on China, is tied to that. But Kanina, when I was going through this, uh, preparing my uh, PowerPoint presentation and all, just to be honest, siguro mamay pag namin with Sir Raul yan, I'm already thinking of a new book, right? <laughs> to, about Philippine modern history, kind of tie it to this, uh, to these three lectures that God willing will be uh, forwarding. Kasi medyo nakaka-excite siya when I think about it. Yung, uh, yung, and I feel uh, siguro as an IR person, I can approach the Philippine history from a quite a different perspective because very comparative yung aking approach as you will see later on right but don't worry i'll try to connect everything later on kung sa tingin niyo parang weird ito how are these things related i'll show to you how things are related later on okay so let's go to the lecture proper um sorry about that i just need to yeah so caught in between empires uh, mas maganda yata yung background na ginamit niyo dun sa uh yung banner niyo i think more appropriate uh uh, so I'm going to discuss from uh, Philippine Revolution to end of World War II. But to be honest, actually, I'm going to go more than that. As you'll see later on, I'm going to go back all the way to the rise of Prussia and the Seven Years' War because my implication at the Philippines that I'm going to discuss later on shortly. Uh, but just before that, okay, just before that, uh, I want to give a preview of what will be lectures. Natin. So our hope po natin, uh, in the next three lectures, uh, beginning with the first one today, uh, we will discuss five important strategic junctures in Philippine history. And actually, this is part of the uh, professor lecture paper that I've done for PUP and also a chapter uh, dun sa aking uh, libro, uh, China's New Empire, na hopefully lalabas next year by Melbourne University Press. So we're going to cover at least two today. And that's a lot, actually, because the background will be a lot. So Battle of Manila, 1898. Actually, we can talk about three battles of Manila, but Battle of Manila 1898 was very important. We're going to talk about another Battle of Manila later on, much earlier. And I'm going to talk about also the rise of Imperial Japan and paano nahirapan yung Commonwealth government natin, especially si Manuel Quezon, in terms of balancing our relationship. Later on, I'll show you some quotes by Carlos P. Romolo in an essay for Foreign Affairs magazine in the mid-1930s, which if you close your eyes and kind of replace Japan with China, it sounds very similar and familiar to our times. So you can see whatever we're experiencing today in terms of US-China competition at paano natin na navigate yan, we were kind of there almost exactly 100 years ago. And I think that's where I want to end this, this series of lecture with President Duterte's foreign policy, any successors in a post-American world. So medyo sasabay yung, mga, yung uh, third lecture natin hopefully with the election process and debates. And hopefully by that time, meron tayong ideas about yung maging foreign policy positions ng mga iba't ibang kandidato natin. And whoever wins at least, we may have an idea what's going to happen. Although I've written already something on that. no. Uh, and just a preview, I, I divide our candidates into three camps. I don't use the Manchurian candidate kind of a label. I don't think that's helpful. So continuity candidates, Bongo, Bongbong Bong Marcos. So the three Bongs, one Bong and two Bongs. And then we have the uh, China skeptic candidates. I would put Caliodi, Lenny Robredo there. Right, and then we have the centrist candidates. I'll put Isco and Lakson there. And based on that, you know, I've made the um, kind of a compartmentalization of where they stand on the China policy. But don't worry, we're going to discuss that more hopefully in lecture number three. You no, know? in the meantime, let's go to the first two strategic junctures in Philippine history. Okay, maybe I'll have to just nagahang yata siya pag nag. Okay. Now, of course, the two key persons we're going to discuss today are, uh, you know, General Aguinaldo and, of course, uh, our, you know, Commonwealth President, uh, President Quezon, right? Now, uh, let me just say that, of course, uh, like a lot of great historians, I'm not a historian, but 
inspired by a lot of great historians, inspired by Tolstoy. I do not believe that great men or women per se drive history. There are always structural, impersonal factors that come together. So that has been my approach in my writings, and that's going to be also my approach in analyzing you lecture nothing today. But nonetheless, you have to have anchors, right? You have certain personalities that played a kind of a large role, or as Hegel would put it, world historical figures, right? So in a way, I'm kind of in between, right? Uh, I believe in the power of impersonal forces, but I also believe in human agency and the role of great leadership. The two are important factors, and we cannot separate them when we try to analyze history and its evolution. So that's kind of my metaphysics or epistemology when it comes to historical analysis. Um, so this will be the outline of our discussion today. I think medyo pagdating dito, magbe-break na tayo. Uh, we might need a 10 to 15 kasi baka sabaw na kayo at mas sabaw na ako. Uh, and then I'll try to finish on the latter part. Then we go to the question and answer. Obviously, the lectures are not supposed to be exhaustive. I'm not going to uh, you know, pretend that I'm going to teach you all the nitty gritties and details of what happened during that time. So it's much more of a theoretical political science approach with historical relevance and, of course, drawing on history. Now, let me just tell you this. As I warned earlier, my approach really is global history and comparative politics. It's always about understanding saan galing yung Pilipinas, saan galing yung ating mga leaders in a broader global context. And where I'm going to start is actually with the rise of Prussia and the Seven Years' War, right? Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you later on bakit mahalagyan. Then we go to the Napoleonic Wars, not because we want to discuss Napoleonic Wars per se, because meron itong implication sa atin sa Pilipinas, especially the establishment of the Cadiz Constitution, right? So this is where modern liberalism will be introduced to the Philippines. Now, that is important because related to the rise of the first Filipinos and our own version of enlightenment in early 19th century, which was a precursor to the rise of the Ilustrado, right? So Rizal and his generation didn't come out of nowhere, right? There were some people who came before them, and a lot of them belong to what Benedict Anderson called Creole nationalist. So ito yung mga Espanyol na pinanak dito sa Pilipinas. In fact, Manuel Quezon could be considered as one of the Creoles, and he would play also an important role a century later in early 20th century in the Philippines. But we're not going to stop there because we're also going to discuss the rise of authoritarianism under Bismarck, as one of your readings suggests, Rizal's Europe was more or less in the shadow of the rise of Prussia and Bismarck, uh, but also under the shadow of the rise of anarchism. So Bakunin and Bismarck were two important figures in the late 19th century Europe that Rizal visited. This is a, this is a Europe where Spain was in decline, where France's future was kind of under question, where Prussia was on the rise, but so was illiberal radicalism represented by the ideas of Bakunin and, of course, the emergence of anti Tsarist activism in Russia. Now, again, we will relate this later on to our topic because we have to also discuss about the rise of America. So while there were huge uh, changes happening in Europe, especially the rise of Prussia after its unification under, uh, uh, after the unification of Germany uh, under Bismarck, there was another global power rising across the Atlantic, and that was the United States. And that will have even more direct implication for us. So while Rizal was kind of influenced by Germany, by Bismarck Germany, and also by Bakunin and anarchism, this is in one of your readings by Benedict Anderson's in the shadow of Bismarck, you can see it there. At the same time, across the Atlantic, there was a global empire emerging, and that was the United States. So as the United States consolidated its power in the Western Hemisphere under the Monroe Doctrine, it began to cast its gaze over the Pacific Ocean all the way to the Philippines, of course, with an eye on the Chinese market. So we'll also discuss that. But as I will discuss later on, the rise of U.S. also has one major implication for one rising power in Asia, and that's Japan. So the visit by Commodore Perry to Tokugawa, Japan, essentially triggered the fall of the Tokugawa uh, regime. And uh, after that, we have essentially the rise of modern Jap Japan and imperial Japan. So U.S. played a very important role in 20th century American, uh, Asian history, not only Philippine history, way before the end of Second World War, which essentially made America the global superpower. So early 20th century, palang, when U.S. was not still seen as a glo global power that it would be, it was already a major power and major force for change, better or for worse, Dita's Asia, and of course, Philippines, was the sole American colony, although, of course, Americans never want to call it that way because they pretend to be not an empire. And lastly, we'll talk about Manuel Quezon and he, how he tried to manage relations 
with the Americans as they try to make us more independent. At the same time, also his strategic flirtation with Imperial Japan. Again, this will have echoes because today, in many ways, President Duterte has been playing this game and my suspicion is his successors will be playing a similar game to what Quezon was playing back in the days. And if you talk to some historians, they'll tell you that the first Filipino strongman was actually Manuel Quezon. Had he not died, prematurely for some, had the Second World War not happened, Manuel Quezon could have established the first modern authoritarian system here in Southeast Asian region, right? Uh, we were ahead of the curve in many ways, but history had other plans for us. Okay, now let's go to the lecture proper. Um, is there any question? <laughs> As I always tell my students, right? Okay. Um, I think I have to do this. Yeah. Let's start with Frederick the Great because he's really a remarkable figure in human history. Uh, I don't know if you guys have done European history and all, but I think he's really one of my favorites. He's the absolute uh, embodiment of what you call enlightened absolutism, right? Or enlightened despotism. And he was really an unlikely emperor. If you look at his biography, it's, it's one of the most remarkable ones you can find. This is a guy who was, who was psychologically tortured by his father because of his homosexuality. In fact, his lover, with whom he tried to escape Russia and go to Britain, they were caught. And he's, uh, from what I remember in one of the books I read, uh, his lover was actually executed in front of him, right? So he had this extremely Prussian, disciplined, uh, strict father, right? In the worst sense of the word. But later on, Friedrich becomes Friedrich the Great, precisely because he turns Prussia into a massive, military machine that would become the envy of the world and in fact in many ways right uh, would change geopolitics on continental europe right in fact those who are familiar with the russian history they would know that catherine who becomes later on catherine the great in russia he first went through frederick the great and then later on of course she changes the history of russia in its direction too um now of course frederick the great was brilliant in many ways he was a brilliant military uh general he was a great soldier but he was also an extremely well-read person. From Voltaire to Immanuel Kant, in one way or another, they sung his praises, they visited him, they met him, they, they wrote about him, and he had, he had really, really deep things to say about human nature and human history. So I, I really suggest for people who are interested in biographies, Frederick the Great is one person you have to look at. Nonetheless, of course, as standard realist international relations theory tells you, when you have the rapid rise of a new power, and in this case, in Central Europe, on, in Prussia, under Frederick the Great. Now, Frederick the Great did some amazing feats, military feats. Nonetheless, the rapid rise of Prussia created a backlash, a backlash from status quo powers. And that was essentially the story of the Seven Years' War. For many historians, the Seven Years' War from 1756 to 1763 was actually the first global conflict, right? So the French Empire, the emerging Russian Empire, Prussia and Europe, uh, Britain, all of them got involved in this in one way or another, right? And this had implications well beyond continental Europe, right? And in many ways, this is also an intimation of what will come under Wilhelm, right? Uh, one and a half century later, when again, Prussia will be on the rise and that will trigger some sort of a backlash or counter maneuvers by status quo threat and powers. Now, why is this important for us in the Philippines? Because, because remember when we talk about Battle of Manila, we have what in mind? The one uh, that we'll discuss later on, 1898, but we also have the other one towards the end of Second World War. But actually there was another Battle of Manila in 1762, whereby the British, right, came here and actually the British occupied the Philippines for, for I, I think at least two years, right? Now, that was very short lived, but it had major implications for Philippines political economy. And that is really brilliantly discussed. And I'm really indebted to Benedict Anderson on so many levels because he was one of the first people, and I think that really pinpointed the implications of that for Philippine political economy. Again, I'm not a historian, so I may have not read some of the great works on this. So, but, for, but Benedict Anderson was really helpful to me because if you look at his work, Cacique Democracy, he looks at the role of the British occupation of the Philippines and how that was actually change the trajectory of the Philippines. You know, uh, in, 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 in medical sciences, there's a term called genetic drift. So when mutations happen, there's a genetic drift. Siguro maintindihan natin ngayon dahil dito sa COVID-19, just ko may bagong mutation na naman. But there's also something called institutional drift. That's a term that was used by 
uh, uh, Achimoglo and Robinsons in, of course, their works, including the off-sided ones why nations failed, right? So you can also talk about the notion of strategic drift, right? So while the British occupation of Manila did not last long, it actually had lasting effects on Philippine political economy. As Benedict Anderson mentioned, one of the things that he did was it, it led to the purging of the Chinese community, especially in Manila, with, which aligned with the British. And in replace, and who replaced them? A lot of them were Chinese mestizos or uh, pretentiously Spanish Filipino mestizos, right? Uh, and a lot of them would come, would become our modern political dynasties, right? So a lot of the oligarchs or uh, major political figures with, who will come to dominate the Philippines political economy uh, in the 20th century, they can trace their emergence actually to what happened during this time, right? When uh, they, when, because this is where, of course, Nick, Nick Joaquin also did a good analysis of this. This is also where you have the rise of Creole nationalists, because this was also during the time of the British-Spanish wars, right? And a lot of Creole, meaning Spanish born here in the Philippines, they were the kind of soldiers and officers who tried to defend the Philippines and later on they were able to kick out the Spanish, uh, the British, sorry, out of Manila. They purged a lot of Chinese who sided uh, with, the, with the British during the occupation era. Uh, and what happened was that they will be replaced by a new mestizo class, right? Who will later on come to dominate the Philippines. But another important implication of this was also the introduction of modern capitalism. Now, of course, the Philippines was at the center of the galleon trade. We played a very important role in the region, but Spain was not necessarily the most industrially manufacturing advanced country. And remember, industrial revolution happened in Scotland, industrial revolution happened in Britain, right? That is a cradle of industrial revolution. So what happens here is that after that, yes, the British were kicked out as a political regime, but British businessmen, British businesses will be increasingly involved in this part of the world. If I'm not mistaken, our historian friends can correct me, Bonifacio worked with the British company later on, right? So the introduction of British businesses and capital to the Philippines in many ways also contributed, right, to the rise of a new petty bourgeoisie. And Bonifacio was very much part of that in one way or another. So even though the British were kicked out as a colonial force, they would, the, 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 the years that followed the, especially the dec decades that followed the Seven Years' War and the occupation of Manila by the British, there we see increasing presence by the British in the Philippines and by extension, increasing modernization of the Philippines political economy, right? Um, <clears throat> now, of course, not long after, another major event happens. And you can say that perhaps France, Bourbon France, was driven to bankruptcy by the Seven Years' War, right? So if you look at Alexei de Tocqueville's analysis of the French Revolution among other great thinkers, you know, the, the Bourbon regime was essentially bankrupted by a lot of these expansionist policies and the Seven Years' War was devastating for them. And in many ways that contributed to the French Revolution among other factors, of course, the ideas of Voltaire, Rousseau, uh, you know, all of the philosophes du Salon, uh, they of course were a big force in that. But um, you see the French Revolution is very, very important because uh, for many things, of course. I mean, first of all, as Tony Jude, the great uh, late historian mentioned, it really French Revolution can be seen as the beginning of modern history, right? And the French Revolution will also be essentially the unleashing of liberal, of universalization of liberal values, right? Now, in the case of the Philippines, of course, because Napoleon later on would come to conquer Spain, et cetera. So for, for a time, Spain would also move in a liberal direction. You have the Cadiz con constitution in early 19th century. That will have an impact. A more liberal governor will be in charge in the Philippines. So liberalism will be introduced to the Philippines in early 19th century. And if you look at important figures, the first Filipinos, Jose Ortega, Rodriguez Vera, uh, Varela, uh, and of course, um, not to mention El Conde Filipino, right? Uh, if you look at a lot of these figures, in one way or another, they were influenced by the French Revolution and the French ideals of revolution, right? Uh, and that's why, you know, uh, this. So I'm showing how these things are all related to each other. Hindi nangyari man nangyari sa Pilipinas out of nowhere, right? And later on, when you look at a lot of key figures in the Philippine Revolution, they were also very much influenced by the ideals of the French Revolution. Now, of course, later on, what happens is that you have the conservative restoration after the Battle of Waterloo, of course, the Bourbons are back. Uh, and in Spain, you have the restoration of the conservative regime. But this is also the time whereby you have increasing radicalization of the Creole in the Philippines, which of course sets the tone for the rise of Ilustrado class, right? So our Ilustrado Filipino class didn't come out of nowhere. In many ways, 
they are indebted to the earlier radicalized French Revolution in influence, uh, uh, you know, uh, Creole uh, or Mestizo nationalists here in the Philippines. Now, the story of the late 19th century actually, in many ways, is the end of what was once the greatest empire, right? The Spanish empire, right? So in many ways, it was the Spanish regime. Now, this was, now, and if you look at uh, emergence of modern nationalism, uh, so again, Benedict Anderson has a great uh, work on this when he uh, tried to uh, show that modern nationalism did not necessarily come out of Western Europe. Actually, modern nationalism arguably came out, out outside of Europe and it came out of places uh, in like Latin America and the Spanish colonies, right? And later on, as we discussed, Simon Bolivar, all the way to Marti, Jose Marti, they played a very important role in this. And of course, uh, in the case of the Philippines, you could argue we were the last Latin American revolution, but we were the first revolution in Asia, as brilliantly showed by Pankaj Mishra in his great book on, on the, From the Ruins of Empire. So if you look at a lot of great revolutionaries in Asia, Liang Qi Chao, in the case of China, for instance, uh, among many others, later on in Indonesia, a lot of their revolutionary pro-independence leaders were influenced by the works of Jose Rizal and our Ilustrado. And remember, even after the defeat of, uh, I mean, after the occupation of the Philippines by Americas, a lot of our Ilustrados would go to Tokyo, would go to Japan, and there they would meet uh, revolutionaries and nationalists from China, from uh, the eight sub South Asian uh, subcontinent. And in fact, there would be a conference later on in Japan whereby Rizal will be declared essentially as the kind of a, a forefather of Asian nationalism. So all of these are connected to each other. And I think these connections, these interconnections are very important. And this is where actually the Philippine Revolution is very important. And this is where it also shows that we were way ahead of the curve. Now, here in the Philippines, we like to bash the Spanish, the phraeocracy. Uh, well, I think Rizal played a very important role in that, in us having very negative views of the Spanish colonization of the Philippines. But the reality at the same time is that in the late 19th century, our levels of literacy were among the highest in the post-colonial world. And we had among the first modern universities in the post-colonial world, including, of course, University of Santo Tomas, and later on what will become Ateneo de Manila University, among others. So we were pioneers in Asia in terms of nationalism, but we were laggards when compared to other uh, 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 Spanish colonies. So, we're, so our Philippine Revolution was separated by almost half a century from what happened in, uh, under the case of Simon Bolivar, uh, among other Latin American leaders. So here, the picture of Simon Bolivar, who, played, who was a Creole, who played a very important role in, uh, in the uh, revolutions against Mother Spain, Madre España, uh, in large parts of Latin America, of course, most especially in Colombia, in modern Colombia. But as you remember, Hugo Chavez, other leaders from neighboring Venezuela would also cite him as his inspiration. Of course, the other one is Jose Marti. And from some of the readings I read, Mohan Rizal went to the same university as Jose Marti. So it's like, all, I don't know if there was a direct interaction between Jose Marti or Rizal in any meaningful sense of the word, but maybe historian friends can tell us about this. But in short, it's a very small world, right? And in short, if you look at the Philippines, our history is very much tied also to what was happening in Latin America, right? Um, now, let's go a little bit back again, because we're also talking about why was there a radicalization in politics in a late 19th century Europe and how that influenced the Ilustrado class, including Rizal and all of these Filipinos who would go to Europe. Now, as you know, of course, there was a French Revolution and the American Revolution towards the uh, late 18th century. In 1848, the French Revolution ideals, right, which were not fully operationalized uh, in France, never mind other European countries, would actually provoke a continent-wide revolution. And that will, of course, have implications also in Latin America and, uh, and European colonies. And as you may know, during the 1848 revolutions, and this is, I think, brilliantly discussed in a very succinct way by Professor Christopher Clark, uh, you know, the 1848 revolutions were both a victory for conservative forces because they were able to defeat the revolutions, but also it was actually a victory for radical forces because even conservative forces had to inculcate some of the radical ideas of the French Revolution, right? Not to mention, right, the nephew of Napoleon will come to power later on following the 1848 uh, revolution, but we can discuss that super, uh, separately. Of course, the great work on that is Marx, Karl Marx's work, uh, the 18th Brumier, right, when he talks about first as tragedy, then as comedy. Now, 
the late 19th century, of course, with the defeat of the 1848 revolutions, uh, unleashes a new era of radicalism and revolutionary ideals on, on the uh, continent, uh, in the European continent. Now, this is a very uh, striking uh, painting uh, by Repin, uh, a, 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 a Russian artist in the late 19th century. It shows Ivan the Terrible killing his son, but actually what it was trying to capture was the opposite of what was happening during his time. So as you may know, modern terrorism in many ways started in Russia. It didn't start in the Middle East, it started in Russia, right? And this involves a lot of anti-Zarist forces, including the anarchists who get to kill Alexander II, right? So what this painting was trying to show is the reversal of the role whereby now the sons are killing their fathers, right? Well, by in the past in Russia, the fathers were killing their sons. Now. Why is this important? Because we're talking about essentially the rise of Bakunin and anarchism, right? And if you look at the great work by, again, Benedict Anderson's Under the Three Flags, he kind of discusses the importance of anarchism in shaping the views of no less than people like Rizal. Now, if you bother to read El Filibusterismo, right, and look at the transformation of Ibarra, Christosom Ibarra, right, into Simon, right, in, in El Filibusterismo, in many ways you can relate that also to the anarchist ideals which were circulating there while Rizal was there also in Europe. But this was also the era of Prussia or now unified Germany also rising. So at once you had the glorification of authoritarian modernization, but also the rise of anarchism in Europe. So these were very radical times. So what I'm trying to explain to you is this. The revolution in the Philippines, again, did not happen in isolation. It was influenced by illustrados who went to Europe in a time when Bismarck was the preeminent power in a time where Bakunin and anarchism were coming to uh, were gaining a lot of uh, traction, and also in a time where Spain was on uh, in a terminal decline. Now that's one more thing, but another thing is moving. So, parang what I'm trying to do is it's, it's kind of like Game of Thrones, right? You're seeing multiple things moving. So dragons coming from the south, and then White Walkers coming from the north. This is what I'm trying to do in these lectures. I'm trying to show you how the Philippines was being squeezed by these all major uh, elements, right? And the rise of empires, right and left. Now, all this time we're talking about Europe, but actually I think perhaps the big story of the 19th century and the late 19th century is really the emergence of America as a potential global empire and later on after Second World War as the global superpower, right? Which is still the case until today if you look at all key indicators, right? Uh, despite the rise of China. Now, for a very long time, of course, America had a very small force, military force. The civil war in America, the first modern warfare was very devastating to America. It cost the life of close to 1 million people. So until the mid 19th century, America was not a really a major military force in the serious sense of the word. Although the Americans began to push for the so-called Monroe Doctrine and the idea there was Europeans get the hell out of this region, meaning Western hemisphere, this is our backyard, right? So in the late 19th century, we see slowly and slowly the Americans asserting themselves as a continental powerhouse, right? And towards the late 19th century, you had someone very, very important whose ideas are actually even shaping China's today's contemporary naval warfare strategy. And that's Alfred Thayer Mahan. Now, Alfred Thayer Mahan in his great book, you know, on naval warfare, right? He made a very good uh, analysis that would shape the policy of people like Theodore Roosevelt, who, would, who was a major uh, uh, figure in the US Navy and later on, of course, will become, become an American president in the early 20th century, right? Now, Alfred Tyreman's argument was this. If you want to, first of all, protect your spheres of influence, and second, if you want to become a global power, it doesn't have much to do actually with ground forces. So he talks about Prussia or France and all of these countries with a lot of ground forces. And he says, look at the world, who is in charge? It's actually Britain. And the reason why Britain was such a dominant force during the time was because of its naval capability, because the Navy gives an ability to project power way beyond your borders. The Navy allows you to uh, consolidate control over sea lines of communications. And Navy is what will allow you essentially to be able to become a commercial power and essentially build up the foundation of an industrial powerhouse, among others. So Thayer Mahan's ideals will be very influential in shaping America's grand strategy in the late 19th century. And we already see the intimations of that 
right, in the mid 19th century. And that will, of course, culminate with the occupation of the Philippines towards the late 19th century, right? So if you look at it, if you look at the Japanese history, which will again be very important to us as we will discuss later on. Uh, so Japan, of course, for hundreds of years, I think 250 years was under the Tokugawa, right? And the Tokugawas were the victors of civil wars among different samurais and feudal lords and uh, in, in Japan. But the Tokugawa uh, regime was one of complacency. And that complacency was punctured after the visit of Commodore Perry to Japan, right, in the mid 19th century. Within a few years, there's civil war again in Japan and the Meijis were the second class uh, samurais, right? So kind of samurai X, my heart and saying, kind of have an intimation of that. They will come to power. So in many ways, what happened was that America's emergence as a naval power, first for commercial interest, but later on for defending their spheres of influence uh, and expanding their territories all the way to Hawaii and the Philippines, that will also push the Japanese to revamp essentially their national policy. In fact, revamp the entire nation. The, process, the major restoration that happened in the late 19th century in Japan was an extremely traumatic event, right? So if you watch the movie The Last Samurai, you could see how traumatic it was, right? Essentially, Japanese had to you know, decimate that whole samurai culture, or actually, they had to reinvent the samurai culture in order to be competitive and be able to defend themselves from the encroaching European powers. So unlike the Chinese, who were facing a century of humiliation, actually more than that, by being uh, torn apart by uh, European empires, the Japanese were able to escape that for a long time. But uh, after the visit of Commodore Perry, they realized they could become the next China if they don't get their act together. So in many ways, the modernization of Japan and its emergence as an empire 50 years uh, later can be also traced to the rise of America. So as America pushed into Asia, right, it awakened the Japanese. Uh, uh, the Japanese giant, right? Or the sleeping dragon in Japan, right? Uh, and the Japanese did not want to end up as a colony or another China. They're very much conscious uh, about that. So you can, this is where we see all of these elements are coming together. So in short, those were interesting times. The times of Rizal were extremely interesting times. Okay. This is, how should I put it? So as an IR person, when I read about history of Rizal, it's all about Spain, right? It's all about Spain. But as I showed you a while ago, Spain is just a backstory here, right? The story here is rise of anarchism, rise of Prussia and unified Germany, and the rise of the United States, and by extension, the rise of Japan. These were the elements that were really moving and would shape early 20th century, if not the entire 20th century's geopolitics in Asia and in our part of the world, right? So, you know, this is what I try to contribute to our discussion because you know, hindi ko masyado nakita siguro dun sa typical discussion of the results time. It's all about friars, it's all about Spain, etc. But this global geopolitical tectonic shifts, right, somehow is missed in the discussions, at least in the some of the mainstream discussions we have with this time. And I felt this is what we have to emphasize. If we want to understand the roots of the Philippine strategic culture and the roots of, of you know, the thinking, the geopolitical thinking of our early leaders. Now, we'll try to take a break soon. So I'll just try to end on a uh, slide and two before we go to you know the meat of the discussion so this background i think was very important so as i mentioned a while ago if you look at the philippine revolution it was asia's first arguably but latin america's last right uh, because in many ways our history is tied to latin america and other spanish colonies so uh, and here and you know anderson has said something very interesting that caught my attention he said something like you know unfortunately for rizal and his generation they their revolution happened at the high noon of empire, right? So the timing in many ways was both right and wrong, no? So dun sa mga familiar, dun sa mga nangyari in the, um, the crucial years of the Philippine revolution. Of course, uh, as you may know, Bonifacio tried, out, uh, tried to reach out to Rizal to get him on board. Rizal was in the pita, and, right? And he was not very, um, let's say, he was not very receptive to the idea of revolution because he was very much influenced by the proper analysis, which was, kung gusto mo revolution sigurado in mo na may chance ka. Otherwise, you're just going to get people killed, right? Now, but this is where Bonifacio at one point was actually the smarter guy between the two of them. Because Rizal was kind of isolated, the contention is that he was not very aware of these big geopolitical movements. And one of them, of course, was the revolution in Cuba and the Spanish-American War, 
right? The emerging Spanish American war. Now, Bonifacio pro correctly calculated that as Spain gets bogged down in Cuba, right? And Spain had to mobilize huge forces, right? In order to clamp down on the Cuban revolution. The calculation of Bonifacio was that the Spanish cannot fight two wars across multiple continents at the same time, right? So Bonifacio perhaps, right, had, had this inkling that if they launched a revolution while there was a Cuban revolution there in the Spanish American warfare, there was a good chance. And somehow Aguinaldo will prove that right, as we'll discuss later on. Rizal doesn't seem to have been as aware of that or as appreciative of this element. Now, we can debate about that. I'm not a historian, but this is one interpretation I have of situation. Why Rizal was not as supportive of the revolution at the moment when Bonifacio wanted it. So I absolutely believe it's total nonsense, especially a lot of people from my school, you know, in UP, et cetera, have been arguing, oh, Rizal is not the true revolutionary, it's only Bonifacio. They don't know what they're talking about, right? That's nonsense. Re Rizal was absolutely a revolutionary, but for him, he just didn't think that was the right time. And in fairness to him, I think because he was in exile and isolated, probably he didn't have a proper appreciation of these tectonic shifts and the, the, and the right calculation of Bonifacio that maybe Spain will not be in a position to fight multiple wars at the same time, especially because they're bogged down in Cuba. This is a very important thing that I, th I think we really have to discuss because it goes back to this Rizal versus Bonifacio debate, which I think is complete nonsense. I think in many ways, they're two sides of the same coin, right? They're the sword and the shield. If I'm going to use the, the uh, to cite the book about Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, you know, the whole civil rights movement would not have happened if either of these sides were missing. You needed a Malcolm X, right? You kind of good cop, bad cop, you know, you needed a Malcolm X to strengthen the hand of Martin Luther King. You needed a Martin Luther King to give moral ascendancy and moral force to the civil rights movement. My sense is we have to have the same argument when it comes to Rizal and Bonifacio. Right, Bonifacio is so much indebted to Rizal in many ways. I am sorry to some of our historian friends from the back in the past and some of our fellow UP friends who say this nonsense that Rizal was not a real revolutionary. He's an American cult, blah, blah, blah. So, these are, so this is where geopolitics is important. Probably, probably if Rizal was not as exiled and as appreciative of these moving geopolitical movements, maybe he would have been a little bit more uh, receptive to the idea of revolution at the time when Bonifacio wanted it. But they, then again, we can debate about this. But what I'm saying is this, I'm very thankful for this lecture because it forced me, right? Uh, it forced me to go into this nitty gritties of this debate, which I don't think has been uh, raised as much. Now, this is where we see the Philippine revolution essentially being caught in between empires because it is coinciding with the emerging Spanish-American war. Now, of course, we can talk about the Spanish-American war, what was happening there. Of course, the Americans, right? were itching for an excuse to get involved in, in Cuba, right? And they got that ex excuse later on when one of their ships was, of course, supposedly hit. Uh, so my Rakshtag fire aversion didn't see good Americans, but we can debate about that. Um, so the Americans were itching to eat into the last uh, strongholds of Spain in the Caribbean and Latin America, right? But as I mentioned a while ago, Fire Mahan was telling America that if you want to keep America safe, you have to first dominate your adjacent waters. So if the Roman Empire dominated the Mediterranean and now China is trying to dominate East and South China Seas, the Americans first dominated the Caribbean. That is where you can secure your imperial boundaries. And then from there, you can further expand. So we see after the Spanish-American War, uh, or actually, well, the Spanish-American War and the decisive victory of Americans would actually uh, we set in motion this Mahanian strategy of American expansion, right? All the way to the Philippines. So these are all related to each other. These are not by accidents. Well, there is contingency in history, but there was also the Mahanian strategy, which was driving America to this part of the world. Not to mention Commodore Perry already set that in motion. This idea that America has to be involved in exploiting or taking advantage of the Chinese markets. And that, again, which is what makes us important. So again, I'm trying to show how the, all of these elements are related to each other. Now, can we take a break? Um, 10 to 15 minutes, 10 minutes, no? Uh, we get back at, uh, uh, so can we take a break for 10 minutes? And that was, that was just a preview, right? Pantaya about dito sa Battle of Manila and Aguinaldo, right? So, so by this time, uh, I think things get very interesting for the Philippines. That was the background. So I'm just trying to give you an idea how I approach this. So later on when we discuss Marcos, I'm not just going to discuss Marcos. I'm going to discuss Soviet Union. I'm going to discuss Nixon Mao Detente, right? I'm going to discuss those things, right? 
Uh, we're going to discuss the Indochina War, the Korean War. So all of these are related, right? Or at least that's 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 my approach. Uh, so I know this is a history class. I hope you're not disappointed with how I'm approaching it. So hindi ako yung, on 1848, ito yung on July this happened, ganito yung, uh, ganito yung suot ng girlfriend ni Rizal. I'm not going to do that, right? That's not my approach, right? Uh, and I, and I, I, I probably don't, I, and I don't know much about a lot of these micro data in history, right? But I think the broad sweeps of history and these tectonic forces, that is what I'm trying to discuss here in our lecture. So let's take around 10 minutes break. Then let's go to Aguinaldo. Then let's go to Manuel Quezon. Then let's have our question and answer portion. And let's discuss all of these things, right? As much as possible. And looking forward to learn from you guys, definitely. Prime Salamat, thank you very much. So 10 minutes break, yeah. Okay, sir. Thank you very much. Um, we will have the 10 minute break. Um, we will resume our lecture series at exactly 2.15 p.m. Thank you very much. And Salamat. Tag-tag tayo ng mga tinuro. Ang daming... And 216, 216, 206. Okay, one second. <laughs> okay, sir, no problem. 216 2, PM, we will resume our lecture series. Thank you very much. Pamantasang una ang pagmamalasaki. Today, the DOH uh, is reporting two additional confirmed cases of Nitong mga nakaraang buwan, humarap ang bansa at ang buong mundo sa isang pandemya. Nangangailangan ng mga bagong bayaning matapang nahaharap at tutugon sa mga pangangailangan ng komunidad. Isa ang Politeknikong Universidad ng Pilipinas na tumugon sa panawagan sa pag-aali ng malasakit sa kapwa. Ang PUP ay tumutugon sa pangangailangan na ating mga mahihirap na kabaranggay. Sa pangunguna ni PUP President Dr. Manuel M. Muhi, mga kaguruan, empleyado, alumni, at mga estudyante ay nagpahatid ang Universidad ng Pagmamalasakit sa iba't ibang paraan. Libo-libong mga frontliners ng ospital 
nakadistino sa mga karatig barangay. at police stations at mga tricycle at pedicab drivers ang nabigyan ng alcohol na locally produced ng Institute for Science and Technology Research. Alcohol na ipinamamahagi namin sa <clears throat> mga tao dito kasi kailangan, kailangan natin ng alcohol. Yun ay kaloob din ng ating universidad sa nasasakupan ng barangay. Kaya ako, in behalf of my council, kami ay uh, nagpapasalamat ng marami sa ating universidad dahil uh, hindi tayo pinababayaan sa lahat ng lalo itong pagkakataon na to na talagang uh, lahat naman na kailangan ng tulong Eh, nakita ko naman sa ating universidad ang magaling at mahusay ng pagsuporta sa ating pamulang. Sa panahon na hirap ang ating mga kababayang makatanggap ng tulong medikal, ay nabigyan ng psychological at medical assistance ang ilan sa mga miyembro ng universidad na nakaranas ng iba't ibang karamdaman noong nagsimula ang pagtaas ng kaso ng nasabing sakit sa bansa. Sama-sama rin binuo ng Medical Services Department at Facilities Management Office ang isang triage sa loob ng PUP sa Tamesa Campus para masigurado ang kaligtasan ng mga empleyado na papasok sa universidad. Bilang dagdag na proteksyon laban sa COVID-19 ay nagproduce din ang PUP ng face shields. Ito ay ipinamahagi sa iba't ibang ospital, opisina ng gobyerno, kalapit na barangay, Philippine Red Cross, at miyembro ng komunidad ng PUP. Hindi rin lingid sa kaalaman ng lahat na nang maipatupad ang Enhanced Community Quarantine o ECQ ay may mga estudyanteng na stranded sa kanilang dorm at hindi makauwi sa kanilang probinsya. Linggo-linggong ayuda mula sa iba't ibang beneficiaryo Maging sa bulsa ng mga empleyado at faculty members ang naipamigay sa mga nasabing estudyante. Una po sa lahat, nagpapasalamat po kami sa PUP kasi uh, malaking tulong po yung nabibigay nila sa amin na uh, bilang kami po ay hindi po nakakauwi. Natutulungan po nila kami sa aming pagkain sa araw-araw. Uh, every week po silang nagbibigay sa amin ng, uh, ng ayuda po, uh, lalo na po yung mga tao sa admin po. When the uh, pandemic started, I didn't have food as well, but um, when I knew that PUP will distribute food for a stranded students from PUP, I was extremely excited and I felt really lucky. Sa tulong din ng Armed Forces of the Philippines at iba pang ahensya ng gobyerno ay may naiuwi ring mga estudyante sa kanika nilang pamilya. Fortunately, uh, OAA, they did the best to have us uh, finish every document to review our student visa. After a few, a few weeks, Uh, we finished the, the document on my student's visa. I, I received a news from Vietnam that they will send uh, a repatriation flight from the Philippines to rescue, uh, to rescue Vietnamese people here. Sa darating na pasukan ay haharap ang buong universidad sa new normal. Sa ng na mga estudyante, administrador at kaguroan ang tinatawag na FlexTel o Flexible Technology Enhanced Learning. Sinisigurado ng FlexTel na walang estudyante ang mapag-iiwanan sa pagbibigay ng kalidad na edukasyon. Sa Flextel ay hindi lamang iisang forma ng delivery ang gagamitin ng mga kaguruan para masiguradong lahat ng estudyante kabilang sa iba't ibang antas ng lipunan ay makapag-aaral.
Ilan dito ay ang face-to-face -face learning sa panahon na maaari ng magbukas ang mga eskwelahan, nasisiguraduhin ang kaligtasan ng mga estudyante at guro sa pamamagitan ng physical distancing, iba't ibang health and hygiene measures, bawas na bilang ng araw na pagpasok, at mas maliit na bilang ng estudyante sa classroom. Online na maaaring synchronous o asynchronous learning na re sa ekonomikal na kakayahan ng estudyante. At digital at off-grid na magpapadala ng instructional material sa mga estudyanteng walang gadget o walang kakayahang kumunek sa internet dahil sa ekonomikal na estado ng kanilang pamilya o lugar. Um, okay, so once more, may we call on Sir Richard Haydarian in continuing his lecture for today. All right, go na tayo. Sige, one second lang, sir. I'm just, sorry, sa dami ng file dito sa, sa laptop ko, nag na eh. Sorry, one second. Uh, hopefully, next Sunday, may time ako maglinis. Um, so, hindi tayo maghang dito. All right. If, uh, if people have any urgent questions now na hindi nila mahintay, we can, you can ask it now. Otherwise, uh, we can move forward. So, at least folks have some rough idea of anong approach ko dito. Uh, sa topic na ito, which I think is very, very complicated. Uh, nakita ko kasi Ma'am Joanna yata forwarded me a lot of questions. So hopefully, is there someone to moderate it? Siguro we can go through those questions one by one or something like that. Yes, um, sir. Uh, mga very complicated pa nga yung questions na nakakatakot na po. So later on, so yeah, wait me to finish the second part of the lecture and then hopefully we have an hour or more. Uh, para by four, medyo one hour na tayo mag-discuss mag hopefully. So let me go back again here. So just to be clear, hindi ko po sinasabi na, uh, hindi, ko, hindi ko sinasabi na we were just um, victims of historical trends. I'm not arguing that the Philippines was just a byproduct of the machinations of global empires. What I'm trying to uh, show you here is the extreme bravery and courage of our revolutionary leaders uh, in terms of pushing for our independence in extremely impossible under extremely impossible circumstances. No, grabbing imagine mo yung ginagawa nila Rizal. They're trying for or, or bounding fashion and our leaders. So what kind of odds they were facing? No, as, as Karl Marx said, no, we cannot choose uh, the historical circumstances within which we're born, right? Uh, but definitely we can choose what we can do with the, within those historical circumstances. So I think first of all we have to understand what were the historical circumstances that our leaders uh, were facing. No, so huge cataclysmic events and huge geopolitical tectonic shifts, right? And two, at least two new emerging empires in the Pacific, uh, Japan, and then the United States. And then of course in Europe with the unification of Germany uh, and uh, the anti zaris movement and later communist movement and uh, Bolshevik revolution in Russia. You can see what kind of mess <laughs> this world was, right? So ang hirap, masakit ang ulo natin. So if, if may nagsabi na napakomplikado ang 21st century, kawawa naman si tatay, marami siyang iniisip, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, imagine ninyo yung, yung, yung dinadaanan na ating mga revolutionaries uh, back in the days. No? Yun lang gusto ko lang ipakita dito. Kung baka, ano lang yan, teaser lang yun. I really try to compress the issue, but I can, I mean, each of this slide alone is one lecture, right? I can go deep into naval strategy, Alter Tyre Mahan, and you know, Theodore Roosevelt. Of course, Theodore Roosevelt later on will be a big figure during the uh, uh, in the process of the occupation of the Philippines by the Americans, etc. This is again a whole topic. There's a whole book about this, you know, starting with Commodore Perry's visit to Japan and how it changes Japan's trajectory and by extension the trajectory of Asia, right? Because Japan becomes the first Asian country to defeat a Western uh, power, and that was of course Russia, right, uh, in 1905, and then so on and so forth. We can go there. Now, let's go now to the Philippines. Kamusta naman yung ating mga uh, revolutionary leaders? So as I kind of gave you a preview a while ago, yet ito yung isang debate no? uh, sa, uh, sa pagitan ng mga ating revolutionary leaders. So ang contestation siguro ni Rizal or yung basa ni Rizal was baka hindi pa sapat uh, yung preparations natin. This is not the right time. 
Nick Joaquin would argue that actually Rizal or more or less belongs to what we can call gradualist or, or eventualist school of thought. The, the idea was that ayusin muna natin yung foundations of our society and let's get prepared to be independent, right? As of course, one of the characters says in, in El Filibusterismo, no? uh, if hindi tayo handa, no? the slaves of, um, of, of today will be the tyrants of tomorrow, right? So basically the argument there, I think, was it Pilosopotasho? Let me go back again to my notes on that. Who, who was kind of making that argument? Kung hindi tayo prepared and bara bara lang tayo, we go for independence. We might end up with with tyranny, right? And unfortunately, that will be actually reality in many developing countries. After the revolutions, even more brutal regimes come into power, right? Uh, you know, I can go on. Just the Arab world, I can go on forever. Like we can talk about Gaddafi. We can talk about all of these crazy dictators who come into power on the promise of revolution and independence and then look at what happens later on we can talk about zimbabwe for instance mugabe right was seen as a very progressive leader right when they went against the white uh supremacist uh people in charge of back then rhodesia right and then look at what happens to mugabe right and actually my argument is that if marcos was not kicked out of the philippines he would have ended up something like mugabe i mean that's essentially my contention that kind of corrupt and and bankrupt regimes etc um but so that's that's where I see the brilliance of Rizal because his two novels, at least, and I know that he wanted to make a third novel, Trilogy. Hopefully we can do that trilogy uh, one day if we have enough courage and all uh, and, and, and skills and all. No, I mean, what Rizal was trying to do is to show all the sides of this debate, all the characters he puts in his book and the transformation of Ibarra to Simon is essentially, you know, it just shows what kind of debates were happening inside the mind and among Ilustrado leaders back then. Right and Filipino revolutionaries. Okay, so as I mentioned a while ago, the unfortunate thing for Philippine revolution was that it happened at the high noon of empire, and I would argue at the high noon of imperial competition, with the emergence of new empires in America and later in Japan, and of course Prussia in Europe, Germany in Europe. Now let's go to the Philippines because now we can go fast forward. Alam natin medyo ang sa Philippine revolution. I'm sure you guys are aware of that. Now, of course, meron. Bato, and then, of course, uh, Aguinaldo, initially, they lose to the Spanish, right? So they're exiled, right? They go to Hong Kong, and then he ends up in Singapore, and that's where things get interesting, right? Because what happens here is we see the first instance where the Philippine leaders, relatively competent leaders in terms of warfare, among others, well-intentioned person like General Aguinaldo. Now, of course, you may mga galit sa kanya dahil sa nangyari kay Bonifacio, we can go on about that. But in fairness kay Aguinaldo, right? He was the driving force of at least the military uh, aspect of overthrowing the Spanish regime in the Philippines, right? So the guy had huge contribution in the Philippine Revolution that cannot be underestimated. Now, going back to him, now, as we know, of course, he gets defeated first by the Spanish. He's put, uh, is forced into exile. And then together with other Filipino revolutionaries, they meet the American mission. If, if I'm not mistaken, the American consul there in Singapore, right? And there... Uh, there's some discussion about what can Filipinos do because they pa parang binayaran pa sila bago sila na exile so parang the Spanish just paid them off get out of here right so they were out there and of course they wanted to come back hindi naman sila na give up diba? so palaban naman sila Aguinaldo and all so they wanted to come back but they wanted to find ways para to make sure pag bumalik sila may chance talaga sila this time to manalo no sa mga Spanish so this is where they started flirting with the Americans or I would put it the other way this is where they became uh, I would say trapped by the American charm, right? So the Americans did not put anything in writing. They did not agree to anything, which is very similar to how Chinese deal with us, right? In these days, you know, all the Chinese, con it's all, all, it's just verbal. They don't, they don't just sign anything. It's very hard to find. So the Americans were like that too, back in the days. So the Americans kind of gave this impression to Aguinaldo that they're willing to help us. And that once we kick out the Spanish, we can be an ally with the Americans, right? So this is what was happening there. Now, Mohang Ambasa ni Aguinaldo was the Americans' are a reliable partner, and they can provide us the kind of decisive military support we would need in order to defeat the Spanish regime, right? So these were the delicate behind-the-scenes negotiations that took place at the height of the Spanish-American War and where Filipino revolutionary leaders were hoping to sign up the Americans into our cause, right, and essentially whereby we can, you know, we can get the weaponries and the backup and support to get rid of the Spanish, which was 
really on a downward spiral during this time. So this is where you see that in fairness to Aguinaldo, he had an awareness of what was happening there, that Spain was going down, the Americans were emerging. So there was, I would say, at least a shallow appreciation of the tectonic shifts that were happening across the Pacific, right? And sometimes shallow, uh, shallow knowledge is worse than ignorance because shallow knowledge may give you the confidence to do things that may end up actually more destructive, right? And this is the problem we had. We had leaders who had some intimations about America. They had an intimations about the decline and essentially the end of Spanish empire, but they did not have very deep understanding of America. What were the intentions of America? They did not have an understanding of the emerging grand strategy in America. They did not have much understanding for the more imperialist voices, reactionary voices that were taking charge of the national security apparatus of America. Perhaps, uh, you know, a lot of our leaders were impressed by America's libertarian ideas, isolationism, because American isolationism was really a big element in the early 20th century and the late 19th century. But I think the imperialist instincts of America was not as much appreciated by, by our leaders. And I think a lot of our illustrados, a lot of our revolutionary leaders were very much aware of what was happening in Europe, especially in Spain, but not much aware of what was happening in Washington, D.C., right? The debates that were happening there, right? So what is the parallel? I think the parallel today is very much what, like now, alam na alam natin yung mga debates sa America, Medyo gets natin yung mga debate within Democratic Party, within Republican Party, pero tignan na napaka-ignorante ang ating mga uh, leaders when it comes to the nuances of Chinese politics. Of course, China is not an open system like America, but you know, my, when, when I see analysis of China, even both by both sides, oh, hindi lang si Duterte, but in critics in Duterte, it's very shallow. It's very, very shallow, right? And so this is my problem. Uh, we have very shallow knowledge of China today, and that's, that, is, that could push us to make some major strategic mistakes, if, if not already, a lot of them has happened. I think the Philippines, Aguinaldo's generation, were in, a lot of them were in the, same pro, uh, in the same trap, right? They had shallow knowledge of America, but not a deep appreciation of its emerging imperialistic instincts and designs, including over the Philippines. And that is where we got a big problem, because if you look at the Battle of Manila, 1898, right? I mean, the, the thing is this, we were beating the Spanish on our own. It's actually highly questionable if we really needed the Americans in terms of their military, uh, you know, really assistance, no? In a way, parang we invited a bigger monster into the game when we were becoming competent enough to beat the declining empire, which was Spain. So if you look at it, among our illustrados, we had a number of people trained in the military sciences, like General Luna, which were very aware, but actually also people in very advanced engineering who were very helpful in terms of uh, us uh, being at the cutting edge of trench warfare, right, uh, against the Spanish. So you had people like Idelberto Evangelista, right, who was trained, uh, I, I think, also in Belgium, civil engineering background now. You had, of course, was a candido Alejandrino, right, who was uh, trained in chemical engineering, I think also in Belgium. Uh, so you had a lot of these engineers uh, trained in Europe, especially in more developed parts of Europe, not in Spain, but uh, like Belgium, for instance, those other parts. Where, and they had very advanced knowledge of modern uh, military science. And they were ahead of the Spanish in many ways. And later on, they would be even ahead of the Americans in terms of their trench warfare. In fact, General Luna later on wanted to apply some of these ideas when he wanted you know, for us to launch a guerrilla warfare against the Americans. Now, and, and in many ways, that will be an intimation of what will happen with Vietnam 50, 60 years later, right? But going back to this, actually our Katipuneros were so good that they were actually beating the Spanish on their own. So as Nick Joaquin says in one of these really arresting pages, the bre breathtaking thing is that Ito na, yung Battle of Manila, wala na, talo na mga Spanish. We're, we just have to get in and claim it, right? And, you know, the breathtaking thing here is that we were doing it on our own. And Aguinaldo played a very important role, of course, in mobilizing our forces and being the, the, the supremo, right? And all the time, really, George Dewey, the American admiral, they kept their, you know, their, their land troops away. They were not really directly significant involved in the skirmishes between the Filipino revolutionaries and, and, and the Spanish, right? 
but at the at the hour of need right at the at the most important golden hour when we should have taken the initiative and occupied manila on our own and get in and probably cut a deal with the spanish whereby the spanish will give it up and we'll take over i mean uh nick joaquin for instance he contends that the spanish would have been willing to make a deal with us directly without the americans involved i don't know i'm not sure about that maybe there were they would never have done that because of course you can understand why the Spanish wouldn't want to do it with the Filipinos rather than do it with the Americans, but that's a diff different discussion. But, but what was clear is that in some crucial hours, right, the Katipunero troops were in a position to take the initiative, take over the Pearl of Asia, right, and essentially take over at least Luzon, right? Um, uh, but they didn't. And the Americans were able to outmaneuver us and deceive us and eventually what happened is that you know while we fought the war to the gates of manila the americans took the initiative made the deal with the spanish and the product was the treaty of paris and clearly our revolutionaries were duped and later on tragically they realized that all this time you know the americans were just using us as the shock troops just for them to have enough leverage to cut a deal with the spanish and essentially tell the spanish hey come on if you're going to lose, at least lose to us, right? Not to these Indios, right? I think that, as, essentially, that would be kind of arguments that the Americans would put forward. So this is really a tragic uh, moment. And this is where leadership, contingency, agency, strategic de decisions matter, right? Because our history could have been very, very different. So had we taken the initiative and occupied strategic positions in Manila, then the Americans would have to think, like now, do we want to launch a war, an urban warfare against the Filipino troops? And back then, remember, if you're familiar with American politics, hindi sila 100% sure how far they want to go in the Philippines. But they were still feeling their way, right? So what happened here, the tragedy is that we made it very easy for Americans to essentially stumble their way into establishing their first colony in Asia, not far from China, right? We could have made it far more difficult. And some would argue if General Luna's plan was given the green light by Aguinaldo, so there will be another mistake also later on, and they didn't, they didn't assassinate General Luna later on. If we went with the plan and hopefully, and it, it went into a guerrilla warfare, and you know, Cordilleras, when you know, Baguio and all where I come from, if, if we leverage our topography and Cordilleras, you know, and, and really unify the Lojanos and other uh, part, other major groups in the country and we gave the americans really a bloody nose maybe the americans would have thought twice about really staying here in the philippines because we would have strengthened the hands of isolation is back in the u.s congress who would say hey this is not worth it but because of some blunders major strategic blunders we made it too easy for american imperialists to come in and essentially tell the isolationists come on we, we took over already and if we don't take over the germans will come in the british the japanese will come in so it's better we, we took it over and now we have expanded our perimeter of imperial boundaries right so now maybe hawaii will be safer or guam will be safer because we have the philippines here at the front line right we push the front line forward right so this is it so I think if we had more nuanced understanding, I'm talking about our leaders back then, of very intense internal debates, like just look at what Mark Twain, very influential figures like Mark Twain were saying about America's colonization of the Philippines. So the isolationist voice was strong, but we would have strengthened it further if we made it really hard for the Americans to occupy Manila and the Philippines. But we didn't, right? First, we lost the initiative in Battle of Manila, and then later on, we didn't follow the General Luna plan. What the, what on earth happened? And of course, some of our officers had this kind of a old Spanish thinking. Now, you know, you want to fight the Americans, it has to be face to face conventional. So that, that kind of false pride also got us into trouble. Yung purum puso puso hindi pede strategy talaga. So my sense is, first of all, siguro kung hindi na matay si Edilberto Evangelista na maga, things could have been quite different because I think Evangelista would have had more influence in Aguinaldo's. Uh, overall strategic thinking, not only in terms of tactical preparation in fighting against the European empires and later Americans. If probably General Luna was not killed and he was listened to, we would have had a very bloody Vietnam-style guerrilla warfare, which would have made it very hard for the imperialists in DC to convince the people to stay in the Philippines. And I think the Mark Twain's and the isolationists in America would have regained the, the momentum, right?
Now, of course, that raises its own counterfactuals. Let's say General Luna won, what would have happened next? Some would say, baka ano lang, meron lang tayo Luzon, pero the Dutch will take already Mindanao because it's near to Indonesia and the British probably would take Visayas or Palawan, etc. We can debate about that. But what is clear here is that because of our shallow understanding of internal politics in the Philippines, we were not able to leverage America's internal liberal politics against its imperial instincts, right? And we would have done that if we had some military initiative beginning with the moment when we were at the Battle of Manila, at the gates of Manila, and also later on with the General Luna plan. We did not do that, right? Okay, now, fast forward now, of course, we know what happens next. The Americans occupy the Philippines. The imperialist voices able, were able to outmaneuver the isolationists. Uh, Roosevelt, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, and uh, yeah, McKinley, et cetera, et cetera, they come in and they try to justify it. And they say it's like a white man's burden and all of that nonsense, right? To justify their colonization of the Philippines without admitting that they have created a colony here. Now, of course, interestingly, the Americans, because they knew that they had to prove to their people that they're not just like other European power, they, they were relatively more benign colonizers. Let's be very clear about that. In fairness to them, right, they, they introduced mass education in ways that the Spanish never introduced, right? Uh, the UP system, a lot of other uh, in educational institutions were, of course, there uh, were established during the American era. And the Americans, of course, tried to also introduce democratic uh, institutions and re representative democracy in ways that the Spanish never did, right? So in fairness, you know, under the Americans, we had a relatively better situation than our Southeast Asian neighbors. It was horrible in the case of Indonesia under the Dutch, right? Uh, it was not so good also in the Malaya under the British, and we can go on and on, right? But the story that I want to really focus on here is also the rise of Japan, right? Uh, in the 1920s and 30s and Japan's military turn, right? Now, if you look at Japan's military turn, of course, that happens really, that's triggered in many ways after the discrimination that the Japanese faced during the Versailles conference, especially from the French, um, among others. But let's go first to this, because when I came upon this article, it really, really got my attention, right? This article by Carlos P. Romolo, of course, who would play later on a very important role uh, for the Philippine foreign policy for decades to come, right? And as you may know, Romulo was a great journalist. So I think he won the Pulitzer Prize also. So pretty special guy, right? So look at his, uh, his article, which I actually forward. And there's some quotes there that I think really feel relevant to, to today's geopolitics, right? So for instance, he says, there are certain lines here which are, which are incredible. He talks about America's tide is ebbing. So he's already talking about America's decline. <laughs> Not knowing that in actually uh, less than a decade, America will be the super dominant superpower of the world, right? So these American declinism perceptions were there even in 1930s. America is ebbing. The Japanese tide is flowing. Now, look at how President Duterte talks about China and U.S. Doesn't it sound very similar, right? But in fairness, in fairness to Romolo, he also had a lot of anxieties and um intimations of danger and peril with the Japanese. He says, for instance, does it not seem fairly obvious that Japan considers her promises and agreements bound to herself only so long as she believes it to be in her own interest to do so, right? So for instance, she talks about, he, he, he uh, cites the spokesman of uh, Japanese foreign ministry who says, Japan's program is decided whatever the League of the Nations decide, you know, it doesn't make a difference. Of course, it was referring to uh, uh, a UN commission appointed by a commission appointed by the League of Nations to investigate the difference between uh, Japan and Finland. So again, if you look at this quote, doesn't it remind you of the Hague ruling, right? I mean, these two quotes, right? Look at the Chinese. They ratify the own clause, right? Uh, you know, they sign up to the own clause. They ratify. They were part of the multiple rounds of negotiation of own clause. But when, right, uh, they do something in the West Philippines and South China Sea that goes against own clause, and then when they lost, right? What did they say? They say it's a piece of trash paper. It doesn't mean anything. Guess what? That was how the Japanese were talking about international agreements or investigations against their shenanigans in this part of the world. Again, I mean, this is where history comes alive because a lot of these dilemmas that were faced by our leaders back then or by observers like Romolo back in the 1930s, right? About Japan, it seems to be very applicable also, at least for some, when it comes to the rise of China, right? Uh, for instance, here, Romola talks about Japan has already officially declared that she has special responsibility in Eastern Asia. She's the guardian of the peace there. Uh, now, 
Look at how China talks about its role in the region as the big brother. Uh, you know, China has its own version of Tiangxia, right? This kind of a harmonious order, which essentially means a tributary system, right? Uh, so we see a lot of parallels here. I'm not saying Ch China is Imperial Japan, right? Imperial Japan was a fascist force through and through and through. But there's some troubling tendencies with the rise of Japan, which makes these quotes very, very alive, very, very pulsating, and very, very, I think, poignant. To our, uh, to our contemporary geopolitics. So, so don't be surprised if I use these quotes later on to actually analyze what we're facing today. But I really wanted to emphasize this because here again, if we only learn from history, if we, if we read the works of our own people back in the days, probably we would have been in a better position of understanding the kind of dilemmas we're facing today. And of course, our leaders, especially Manuel Quezon, would face a major dilemma here in the early 20th century, uh, especially in the interwar period. So what happens in the early 20th century is essentially the establishment of a post-European Asia. So for hundreds of years, beginning, you can argue, with Magellan's arrival in the Philippines, not discovery, but arrival in the Philippines, for hundreds of years, Europeans would become the dominant force in Asia, especially in Southeast Asia, right? And in Southeast Asia, all the way to Taiwan, multiple European powers will be fighting against each other, the Dutch, the Spanish, the Portuguese, the British, right? Uh, and then, but by the early 20th century, essentially the Europeans were passe, right? Uh, in, well, in, in, because America and Japan would become the really dominant forces here. Now, Britain was still hanging out. France was still kind of trying to be there in Indochina and all of that. But clearly the trajectory was in favor of Imperial Japan and the United States. Now there were essentially establishing a condominium or condominium uh, in an IR terminology here in the Western Pacific and in East Asia region. So here, America builds its first de facto colony with an eye on Chinese markets and, of course, also an eye on the rise of Japan, which they were very worried about. Japan, after especially the Versailles conference, begins to have a break with both liberalism and liberal empires. And here we'll have increasingly a militarist turn in Japanese domestic politics, which eventually will also shape its foreign policy in the run-up to the Second World War. Of course, that, that process was set, was set in motion with the invasion of Manchuria and then China, Nanking Massacre, etc. We know what happens uh, with Japan there. So Japan will begin to try to establish its own version of Monroe Doctrine, the kind of Ashatic Monroe Doctrine, the East Asia Co-Prosperity Zone. That is what they will try to create. And of course, after the invasion of Pearl Harbor, the Japanese gave them only a few years to be able to consolidate a massive empire here so that they will have sufficient resources to withstand an American blowback. Now, uh, there are also different accounts of why Japan engaged in Pearl Harbor. One of the other accounts is that the Japanese were already anticipating the Americans imposing an oil embargo on them. And their idea was that before they strike and paralyze us, let's take the initiative. But of course, that was a very big gamble. And, and, and the Japanese also made a huge miscalculation about, about America. They underestimated the ability of America to mobilize military force so fast and for the isolationist mood to shift towards confrontation towards Japan and also defeating the fascist power. So the Japanese also made their uh, strategic mistakes here. But that's beyond the topic we're trying to discuss here. But what I'm trying to give you is that if you're, if you're reading really the, hist uh, the, the, the history and the documents, et cetera, in early 20th century, especially in the interwar period, it really feels like these two empires were sleepwalking towards war. I'm not saying it was co completely unavoidable, but it was not like the Americans were also doing much to deal with the insecurities of Japan about the potential embargo against them, right? Should things get ugly. Of course, the Japanese making an alliance with Nazi Germany didn't really help the situation at all, but definitely I don't think that was the decisive factor here. But, uh, and we have to understand why they attacked the Pearl Harbor, right? So many things could have been done probably to avoid that and keep the theater of Second World War primarily in Europe, in Western Europe and parts of Africa and the Middle East. But in many ways, the trend lines were clear. The two powers here in, in East Asia the, in the Western Pacific we're really sleepwalking towards war. And this is where, that's why this is important because if you're really familiar with history, a lot of global conflicts happen not because people are stupid or because everyone is fascist and wants to have war. In many ways, people just sleepwalk into war by miscalculating each other's intentions and each other's willingness to stand up, right? Or underestimating each other, right? 
or overestimating their own capabilities, right? So if you read the work of uh, uh, Guns of August, for instance, uh, by Talkman, right? She talks about uh, how Europe sleepwalked in the First World War. No one wanted the First World War and yet it happened. So in many ways, you could argue that maybe both Imperial Japan and US were not really itching for a conflict, right? But they were sleepwalking towards that, which just tells you what kind of impossible situation the Philippines was in because Manuel Quezon was trying to win the Philippines independence. So as you know, you know, Manuel Quezon was very ambitious guy. He had, he had his own ideas about trying to, I mean, probably wanted to be kind of like what Nero would be later on in India, right? The grand, the grand statesman, right? And he was very eager in negotiating the Philippines independence via the US Congress, at the same time trying to elbow out Osmani and other domestic rivals, right? Uh, that's why he didn't support some of the initial uh, 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 initial agreements towards the independence and try to have a version that will reflect him, even though there was not much changes in the subsequent agreement. So beginning with the deliberations on the Jones Act and culminating later on the tidings McDuffie Act, you know, uh, you know, this is where he was trying to really win independence for the Philippines. But the problem for Manuel Quezon was, was Japan, right? Because more and more people in the American national security establishment were saying, okay, even if we give the Filipinos independence, how long can they last without ending up as a Japanese colony, right? So that was beginning to become a big discussion there. So Quezon knowing that being very much, and here we have a situation whereby actually we have a Filipino leader who's very familiar with domestic politics of relevant empires, especially America in this case, right? But the problem here was that Quezon, in order to win independence for the Philippines and put himself in a position of power in the post-independence Philippines, he kind of began to poo-poo any Japanese threat to the islands because this served, you know, as Goodman explains, and I send you the journal article, the very important dual purpose of encouraging American supporters of Philippine independence and of reassuring Japan's leaders that the free Philippines would be a friendly Philippines. So, so him with his ambition of independence and he himself being the great statesman of an independent Philippines, he was trying, he was playing this very dangerous game, right? Kind of underplaying the Chinese, the Japanese threat to the Americans. And at the same time, trying to make America a little bit or telling the Japanese that the Americans will not be so involved in the Philippines. So don't worry, an independent Philippines will not be a threat into you. So that, that's a very dangerous balancing game. That's a very dangerous balance in games. And at times, at least this is a contention of Goodman, uh, our dapper ex-president a little bit became too cozy with the Japanese at some points, right? Uh, he developed extremely close and rewarding friendships with a number of leaders of Japanese business community in the Philippines and their associates in Japan. So clearly the Japanese were in the business of what political scientists called sharp power, using economic linkages, personal charisma, etc., to kind of win over this uh, kind of a wobbly uh, uh, the leaders in, in smaller countries who are trying to diversify from traditional allies towards new allies, right? So if you look at it, I mean, I could just replace some words there and this could apply already to the Philippines today, right? <laughs> look at what the Chinese are doing today in the Philippines, right? Through in, in infrastructure investment, et cetera. You know, they try and in, in friendly business communities here in the Philippines, they try to charm our president. So this is a very interesting thing here, right? And in fact, to be honest, reading of Ma Quezon helped me to better understand our situation under Duterte between US and uh, China. Again, not exact parallel, but I think very helpful precedence, right? And here you see, when you try to play two superpowers against each other, you might end up as the lunch. And that's exactly what happens to the Philippines. Quezon, who I think was incredibly smarter than some of our recent leaders and incredibly more sophisticated in strategic thinking and an incredibly, incredibly Machiavellian politician, consummate politician, even he, could not pull off an optimal balancing. And in the end, in the end, we know what disaster happened to the Philippines, right? Uh, we know what happened, right? The Americans were not prepared for the Japanese and the Japanese come over here and smash their way through, right? And of course, the next battle of Manila, we can discuss that in our next lecture, we saw what happened in the next battle of Manila. The Americans just rampaged through Manila because they didn't wanna sacrifice their troops. So they just bombed huge parts of Manila. My late good friend, Carlos Seldran,
keeps on talking, kept on talking about how why Manila just lost its soul uh, because of the huge American bombing here during this uh, towards the end of Second World War, right? When and the Japanese were also in a death rampage. So uh, our good friend, my good friend Sionel Jose, for instance, uh, uh, he he talked about the brutalities that were happening when the Japanese felt that they were about to be defeated. They just went on on killing rampage. So essentially, the Japanese American just bombed the hell out of him. Of the Philipp of Manila, one of the most beautiful cities in the early 20th century, and we have, we have not recovered from that yet. The, the core, the soul of Manila, was killed during the next Battle of Manila, the Third Battle of Manila, you could argue, uh, was in 1946, right? Uh, so this is this is the this is the tragedy we're facing. So I really wanted to discuss Kazan because Kazan was really trying to do a kind of an optimal balancing strategy, but even he could not do it, especially in a situation whereby two colossal empires were already sleepwalking towards war. So in short, I'm telling you, we were in a watch, whatever complaint we have about today, my goodness, we were in far worse situations. And we had far better leaders back then who also struggled to come out of it better, right? And in fairness to Aguinaldo, he was a patriot, he loved the country, he had huge military credentials, but he was duped, right, by a rising power in his obsession to get rid of a declining power. Again, I think those themes very much, very much speak to our political moment today, to our geopolitical era today. And that is why I felt we have to emphasize that. And this is, I hope this is a kind of a discussion that will enrich uh, uh, your class. Uh, and, and again, no pretension to be a historian. So you, you're free to correct me and have violent reaction to some of the points I raised, but I definitely stand by, the, by some of the broad geopolitical themes I have raised in this lecture today. So Marami Salamat, and I look forward to our discussion for the next hour. Thank you very much. All right, thank you po, Sir Richard Haydarian for your uh, thought-provoking um, words. Um, pong... Naka-silent ka yata, Gabi. I'm sorry, can I... Uh, hello po, yan. I'm here. Okay. Sorry, sorry for that. Um, thank you, Sir Richard Hidarian, for your thought-provoking. Um, pala, sorry. For your thought-provoking words and um, napakalaman na discussion natin ngayong hapon na ito. And we are now heading to our um, open forum. But first, we are now um, proceeding to the pure, free, for for a few reminders um, for our open forum. Okay, so without further ado, here are a few reminders before we do proceed on our open forum. I think there were questions which are forwarded, uh, some of them to Mom Joanna. Maybe you can raise them again so that everyone can hear and then we can go through them. Yes, uh, sir. Maybe yes, that's sir. an option. Yeah, yeah. I chose some of the interesting questions lang. Pero sa, yung iba naman na discuss mo naman, sir. Pero siguro, you can just elaborate on it more. Uh, you can yes, read through them uh, one by one. Uh, Gap. Yes, similar yes. po sila. Maybe we can jumble some of the questions. Ah, yes, similar yes, yes, yes. Para isang sagot na lang. Oh, para hindi pa ulit-ulit balikan yung isang team. Yeah. Yes po, yes po. But first, before that, um, Kung meron pong mga katanungan itong mga, uh, mga kasama po natin dito sa Zoom, um, especially our professors and esteemed guests, uh, you can use your raise hand button for us to for, for us to recognize you and give you the floor. Um, but first, ito po muna yung unang katanungan, sir, from um, Keith Sherwin Alonso of BA History 3.1. Um, do you think there was any form of coordination between U.S. and Filipino forces before Pearl Harbor? Does the Philippine government have access to American intelligence reports about Japan. Um, was President Quezon made aware of existence of station cast? Did he or his cabinet, um, excuse me, had access to purple decrypts? How do you think these intelligence reports factored into Filipino defense plans prior to Pearl Harbor? Um, thank you for that. I'll give an answer that I never gave in any forum. My short answer is I don't know, right? Uh, I don't think that was part of my portfolio to know about it. I have absolutely no idea about the details of that. So I'm not going to pretend what was the degree of coordination between our forces and Americans. All I can say is this. If MacArthur was really a competent guy, he didn't have to, he didn't have to say I shall return, 
there, we were absolutely unprepared for the Japanese invasion. It's like really shocking how recklessly irresponsible the Americans were. I mean, the Japanese, when they were bombing the hell out of our airplanes and everything here, when they invaded us in Second World War, they themselves were shocked. Like, is this a joke? Like, where is the defense? Where is the preparation? So the Americans were completely unprepared for that, which is which shows a massive intelligence failure on the part of Americans, a huge level of complacency and arrogance on the part of the Americans and the Western powers who repeatedly underestimated the Japanese, right? This, this is really the story of early 20th century, constantly underestimating the Japanese, constantly, uh, you know, uh, the discrimination against the Japanese, among others, both on the diplomatic level against Japanese minorities in America, among other things. So unfortunately, who paid the price for that? A lot Philippines, right? We paid a huge price. That was really a brutal era. And let me tell you this. Um, one of the stories that always stuck with me is uh, from my grandma. So my grandma from Vigan, uh, Ilocano, uh, and, and she's like Chinese uh, Ilocano, right? And, and her father was a uh, top official in Lojos back in the day. And uh, the father, uh, he was suspected of being the head of the hook, no? Uh, rebellion and, and some of the other resistance groups against the Japanese occupation. So when my grandma was, I think, just three or four year old, right? She was being forced to watch her, her parents being buried alive. But thank God, she's such a brilliant person that because they were, um, they were kind of high level official, uh, not in Vigan, but some, one, some of the smaller town around. Um, their, their house was next to the Japanese-run school. So every morning, as a little kid, almost a toddler, she would hear the Japanese imperial uh, song, National Anthem. So when they were about to bury her parents, she begins to sing the Japanese imperial anthem, which she can still sing until today. She's 84 year old, I mean, 83 years old, God bless her soul until today, because that was really a big moment in her life. And guess what? She saved her parents. She saved her parents. The Japanese, when they saw this little toddler was singing the national anthem, essentially the argument was maybe they're loyal to us, blah, blah, blah. But you know, my grandma just had that instinct. She has to do that in order to save her family. So these are some of the really brutal stories I remember from, I mean, I've, I've been told about the Japanese era. Yeah, but I'll keep it there, right? So, I mean, it's just, it's just amazing how recklessly responsible the Americans were, how complacent they were. And let me tell you this, in many ways, I feel that has been the story also of Americans in the Philippines, their influence in the Philippines over the past decade or so. Uh, I remember very well, I'm not going to name names. There were some Americans who, who thought, you know, when Duterte was about to become president, oh, he's just, he's just all talk and bluster. He wants to become president. He'll just hold the line. Guess what? That didn't happen. And for some reason, this ignorant American official, I got to meet him later on. He was in another place. And I was wondering why these people are not fired, right? Uh, so unfortunately, I'm not saying all Americans, but I think there were a lot of Americans here who were so complacent about the rising influence of China and by extension underestimated the, the consequence of rise of people like Duterte, right? So if I saw that in, in our era, I won't be surprised. It was even worse back, back during America's uh, occupation of the Philippines in the Commonwealth era. Probably they were even more complacent and probably they were even more imperious towards their Filipino counterparts, right? So, so I, I think indirectly I may have answered some of the questions that was raised there. So uh, yes, uh, for the first time I'll say, I don't know exactly the answer to your question, but in my Heidarian way, I try to answer you in different way by giving you the bigger picture. So maybe you can connect the dots on your own. So much for that question. So thank you, sir, for answering our first question. So coming once more from Bachelor of Arts in History 3-1, then Carl Sebastian Yerdugi. Do you think that the colonization of Spain and America affected even our political preferences such that we have a tendency to ideologies in our culture? What are the advantages and disadvantages of it? And how should we look at it and make it one of our own? It will be able to use it for the welfare of the Filipinos, regardless of social and economical status. Yeah, that's a that's that's a very good question. Um, when I wrote my book on Duterte, uh, a part of my analysis was that uh, if you want to understand the, the the Philippine state formation and our political culture, you have to really look at the combination of factors, especially the uh, mixture of Spanish, Hispanic political culture and American political culture. So if you look at the modern Philippine politics, we're very similar to, I would say, Central American, some of the Latin American countries. Now, some people do not agree with it, ag ag agree with me, 
uh, on that point or on that line of uh, argumentation. Uh, but I think I broadly agree with uh, Benedict Anderson, among others, who has identified some major continuities between Latin American politics and Philippine politics. I mean, just on the level of political form of government, presidentialism has been a kind of a trend here in the Philippines and in Latin America. We have that uh, uh, in, 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 in common. Uh, of course, the, what we also have, to be more specific on this, is this culture of codilismo, right? Codilio, right? This kind of a big man, hacendero mindset, right? Um, who treats essentially the citizens as subjects like a hacendero treats the farmers and people working in his land as subjects. That codilismo has been very much common in both Latin America and the Philippines. And actually tomorrow I'm about to have a lecture in Rio de Janeiro uh, with the Sao Paulo University. Uh, and there I'm gonna compare Philippines and, and Brazil, right? Especially Bolsonaro and Duterte. So I think there's a lot of similarities there. And, and it's not just a question of political psychology or just the nature of our politicians. Although I really, I really suggest folks to read the book, The Autumn of the Patriarch, 1975, written by Gabriel Marquez, right? Which was a kind of a parody of General Franco, General Franco in Spain, right? And of course, Marquez coming from Colombia, right? He very much is also influenced by his own understanding of the autocrats in, in Latin America, right? Now read that. And you can see how much that's applicable to some of our leaders here in the Philippines, right? And I've quoted some of the quotes, uh, some of the passages from, uh, from Autumn of Patriarch of Gabriel Marquez, and I kind of connected it to President Duterte, among others, right? But probably it, the same thing applies. Should Marcos have been in power forever or Quezon had his own way to become the strongman of the Philippines through and through? So there's definitely some similarity. Now, of course, from a political economy standpoint, uh, the Spanish introduced a very extractive uh, economic institutions that more or less um, serve as the foundations of very extractive political institutions. So for those who have read, for instance, Why Nations Fail or journal articles by Chamoglu and Robinsons, look at their analysis on the part of Spain. Like, for instance, why, they explain why Mexico is so different from America, right, in terms of levels of development. And of course, their analysis is because uh, the, the Spanish created very extractive, right, uh, systems of, 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 of uh, economic productivity as opposed to the more inclusive manufacturing uh, middle class driven that happened in, in uh, Anglo, uh, Ang uh, Anglo influence America, for instance, right. Um, so they try to look at that. Now, if you look at their analysis of Latin America, it's very similar to the Philippines, right, uh, both like Latin America were raw exporting countries. Uh, both like Latin America, we have very weak manufacturing base. Although Amer Latin Americans are way ahead of us, I would say. I think Brazil is way ahead of the Philippines. Uh, but relatively, compared to our northern neighbors, so in the case of the Philippines versus China, Japan, etc., in the case of Latin America versus U.S., there's that similarity whereby relatively de-industrialized or under-industrialized in countries not then. Now, that is important because history shows that countries which are more manufacturing-driven tend to have a larger middle class and countries that tend to have larger middle class tend to have more robust civil societies. And countries that have tend to have more robust civil societies tend to have more democratic politics, right? So this is essentially the modernization theory. Uh, Samuel Huntington, among others, have, have argued that a lot among political scientists. Now, so in Philippines, similar to Latin American countries, we have very high levels of inequality, right? Which is reflected in our economics, also reflected in our politics. We have the prominence of political families or codilios, that's, that's similar in Latin America and in the Philippines also. And we have relatively weaker middle class because of, of our extractive indus industries, right? So few oligarchs tend to control big businesses, etc. This has been the story of Venezuela, Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, Philippines, very similar. So of course, all of it, this is an ecosystem. So all of them are related. So if, I, if I'm going to put it that way, Philippine, Philippines is more similar to many Latin American countries than a lot of our Asian neighbors. So if you look at the political economy of Thailand, for instance, or Vietnam, it's very different from the Philippines. Uh, uh, you know, while if you look at the political economy of Brazil and, and Mexico, for instance, it's far more similar to the Philippines. And I think in many ways that may explain when you have similar political economies, you tend to also create similar political outcomes, right? And we see that also reflected in, in the rise of authoritarian populism and nostalgia for authoritarian past, which is absolutely common between Philippines 
and Brazil and a lot of other Latin American countries that I have, I have studied, although of course not an, as an expert, but only from a comparative politics standpoint. I hope that kind of answers your question. But of course, you can make this grand historical argument that yes, all of us in one way or another were un, either I, under Iberian empires. And when you were 500 years under Spain or hundreds of years under Spain or Portugal, et cetera, that is going to have some lasting impact. You know, the term there is path dependency, right? When you have been so, you have, you have been under a certain political economy for so long, that's going to have long-term implications. Now, in fairness, as I mentioned, there was a liberal moment in Spanish empire in the Philippines. There was also a liberal moment when the Americans came here. But if you look, oh, I, I, I did not put that in my slide because uh, there were a part. There were there were more parts. Hopefully, I wanted to discuss more America, but I just didn't want to go too much into it. Maybe we can we can discuss that later on more in the second lecture. Uh, but you see, when Americans came here, um, which goes back to the Cacique democracy reading, ang ginawa ng Amerikano ay hindi sila gumawa ng bagong elite sa Pilipinas, or hindi sila gumawa ng uh, hindi sila nag oversee ng emergence of a new elite. What the Americans essentially did was to cut a deal with Spanish era elite, right? Uh, and nudge them towards more liberal competition, right? So if you look at the formation of the Senate and the Congress in the Philippines, which more or less determined will be the next president, which more or less determines, which more or less determines, uh, determines appointments to the bureaucracy, right? If you look at it, essentially what happened there is that the Americans cut a deal with the pre-existing cacique, which I connected to the elite that emerged after the Battle of Manila when the, when, the, when the British occupied the Philippines and the Persia came afterwards. So in short, you can draw a line from the mestizo Chinese elite or Spanish elite that came into power after Spain kicked out this, the British. I'm talking about 17, what, 1778, whatever, all the way to the American arrival. And the Americans essentially caught a deal with these guys, right? And then nudged them by creating some sort of a facade of democracy, right? And that was uh, this, this Congress and Senate and all. But of course, the Americans introduced property qualifications and everything that made sure ordinary people like us, you know, would have no chance to stand for this kind of elections. So the Americans essentially reinforced pre-existing extractive political and economic institutions with an American spin. And let's not forget, the America that conquered the Philippines in the 19th century was... Uh, America of Gilded Age. It's what Mark Twain explained, where, whereby you have few oligarchs controlling everything and very weak bureaucracy. So Americans never introduced b strong bureaucracy to the Philippines in as much as the Spanish did it, right? Uh, Spanish were strong in introducing uh, certain religion and political culture and certain educational institutions. Americans the same, but both of them did not introduce strong bureaucracy to the Philippines, unlike what you had in Singapore and Malaya Federation, for instance, whereby you had much more, much stronger, robust state institutional heritage, which the Likuan News and Matters could take advantage of. We didn't have that in the Philippines. Now, um, so this is essentially what happened. And remember, the Americans also, when they came here, they did not push for strong land reform. For strong land reform. Because, uh, you know, if, if you look at the literature and political economy, land reform tends to be a very important factor in creating much more inclusive economy, right? Because when you have land reform, you create a strong agriculture sector. That strong agriculture sector can create uh, the food that you need for manufacturing. And then when you have light manufacturing, you can create products that you can sell to your relatively wealthy agricultural sector, to your rural area, and then the two will work together and move up. That's the story of Taiwan. That's the story of South Korea. That's the story of Japan so on and so forth. That didn't happen in the Philippines. And going back to it, the America that conquered us is late 19th century America with very weak bureaucracy, right? Uh, with high appreciation of demagoguery and populism. And, and, and it's not the America that comes into power later on during the New Deal. Siguro kung yung America na conquer sa akin, yung America of not Theodore Roosevelt, but America of uh, the other Roosevelt, right? That FDR, right? Maybe the Philippines would have had a stronger bureaucracy, right? Stronger emphasis on bureaucracy, stronger emphasis on manufacturing labor unions, a much more progressive political economy, which we definitely did not get with, with the America that conquered the Philippines. So para nakaroon ng path dependency by that time. Eh? So this is the problem. So, uh, you know, we have many jokes about it, right? Like kind of like Spanish corruption with American efficiency or something like that, right? So, so parang, if I'm going to make an argument, I think on their own, the Spanish and Americans were not the worst. Sometimes they were relatively better. 
But their combination did not create the best kind of political elite in the Philippines, right? It created the most spoiled, rapacious elite you can imagine in Southeast Asia. You see, one political scientist said, if you only know one country, you know no countries. In my case, I'm familiar with at least two or three developing countries, I would say, proudly, right? Not, not America, I mean, developing countries. And I can say Filipino elite oligarch is extremely rapacious, right? There's absolutely no sense of patriotism and nationalism you can see in other elites. They're very cosmopolitan. In short, they don't care much. About, I'm not saying all of them, but on the whole, my goodness, ibang level yung, yung Philippine oligarchy. And by the way, I'm not talking about the big businessmen. I'm talking about political dynasties who are in charge. Just look at how they talk about ordinary people behind the scenes. My goodness, right? Para mga kodilyo, para mga hasyendero mag-isip. Mag yung pag-isip nila, hasyendero eh, right? Hindi yung leaders na we have to raise the level, yung, yung antas ng development. Ng, it's, it's not really like that. We have had some good leaders. We have had some good technocrats throughout times uh, who tried to push us in the right direction. But I think the story of the Philippines in the past 500 years is essentially that, you know, rapacious oligarchy. And the ang awayan talaga dito is between liberal oligarchs and uh, authoritarian oligarchs. So essentially, you know, my, my uh, previous book of one was titled The Rise of Duterte, A Populist Revolt Against Elite Democracy. And then someone joked, uh, kind of commented, well, guess what? Now we have uh, elite autocracy or something like that, right? So, so that tends to be the story of the Philippines. And why is this relevant to foreign policy? Because due to the weak bureaucratic heritage we got from both Americans and Spanish, even our Department of Foreign Affairs, for instance, or if not DFA, in fairness, DFA is among the better bureaucracies, agencies in the government. But overall, if you look at it, the kind of people who come to shape the Philippine foreign policy, a lot of them have no business being there. Very shallow understanding of geopolitics. A lot of them are just nagkataon na gusto lang sila ni Presidente, no, malapit sila kay Presidente. And look at the number of political appointees, thousands of political appointees, right? Getting into... Uh, critical position. No offense, someone became USEC for strategic communications in DFA, who I'm not very sure was really someone very adept in foreign policy. No offense sa kanya. I'm just saying. Appoint yan. So marami kang USEC dyan, right? Dyan sa DFA, for instance. And I'm not sure these people are really foreign policy guys who should be there. Now, Teddy Boy Loxin, let me just tell you thing too. First of all, I don't know what he tweets because he blocked me. I don't know when um, and why, but I can guess why. Um, so I can only get to know what he tweets when it's important or he's attacking me or something like that. But so the other day I was listening to Teddy Boy Loxin. Actually, Teddy Boy Loxin is great. Uh, he, he writes very well. Brilliant, brilliant writing. I really like it. Not that brilliant, but just good enough brilliant. Uh, but I'm not sure he has the kind of sophistication and analysis of foreign policy. And I would easily argue Teddy, uh, Teddy Loxin is the best foreign minister we have had under Duterte. Maybe the bar is not that high. But even Teddy Loxin, I'm, I, you know, He's not, you know, so people get very impressed by his speeches and all, but that's not strategic thinking, right? That's not strategic. You go to China, right? You go to a lot of these rising powers. They're strategic thinkers. They're, they, they, can, they can barely say some beautiful prose, right? But they're really deep thinkers. Or you go to Vietnam, for instance, something like that, right? So in the Philippines, I think our strategic culture is a lot about rhetoric. It's sophistry. And a lot of political appointees who get there who have no business being there, right? Uh, and but thanks to President Duterte and all of this crazy stuff, jet ski and all of that, yung ating foreign policy ay nagiging uh, household issue. So hindi ako nagri sa mga tao na sabi, no one cares about foreign policy. It's true, of course. Unay ng taong bayan yung yung gut issues na kita natin sa Pulse Asia, yung mga top issues sa education, inflation. But whenever may nangyari malaking bagay doon sa West Philippines, yung inapoy ng ating mayingista, yung sa uh, Juan Felipe or doon sa Second Thomas Scholl, for instance, tingnan mo, lakas ng reaction ng tao. And I can say that because I don't know about other academic friends of mine and all, but I'm quite active on social media and I work in mainstream media. You can get so many views online by talking just about foreign policy. Who could have imagined that? Can you imagine getting thousands of likes and share by saying something just on foreign policy? I don't think that anyone thought that's possible a long time ago, but it's happening. And I don't think it's because I'm charming or something like that. I think that people really have, really have really genuine interest in foreign policy. And there were times na kumakain lang ako sa isang, I don't know, and someone recognizes me. And may lumapit pa nga sa akin once, sabi niya, alam mo, prof, 
I mean, ko, gusto ko talaga si Duterte. Pero di ko talaga maintindihan yung China policy na yun lang talaga hindi ko masisikmura. So I have had experiences like that. There was once, papunta ako sa airport, yung driver, nagde-debate siya sa akin on on clause. Parang, wow, that's an interesting one. Like, on clause talaga. On clause. At parang, so ako naman, very Socratic. I never say you're wrong. No? Hindi ako elitista in that sense. Alam mo, style ko parang Socrates. I'll just throw back your ideas at you until you realize you're wrong. Right? Uh, so yun naman ginagawa ko, Socratic. And alam mo ginagawa sa dulo sa amin? Alam mo, sir, hindi ko naman talaga alam yung talagang det- details yan. Pero yun na narinig ko kay Tatay Digong doon sa radyo. Eh para may sense naman siya, wala naman Sylvia International Law. But anyways, what I'm saying is that there is a growing degree of consciousness about foreign policy and all. So I think it will be harder for people to get away with blah, blah, blah foreign policy statements. Whether it's Duterte, whether it's our foreign sector, whatever. So I'm actually cautiously optimistic. And nakikita ko as the level of consciousness and discussion raises, hopefully there will be more pressure on our foreign policy elite to be more foreign policy and not just elite, right? Because a lot of our foreign policy elite are just elite people who got there because they can speak English or whatever or French, right? But yung substance ay wala. I mean, wala silang publications, wala silang any relevant contribution to strategic studies, etc. Wala. Right? So hopefully we'll have more foreign policy discussions there. Uh, and I'm optimistic, in fairness, over the past 10 years, we're moving in a very good direction. And if you're going to ask me who are, who, are, who are the presidents, I think, who have, who have had more sophisticated foreign policy thinking, definitely Marcos is there. Oh, we're going to discuss that very, uh, very soon, hopefully in second lecture. They are a fan of Marcos' domestic politics, but I think his foreign policy were okay. And the other Ilocano guy, sorry for saying that, Ramos. I've talked to President Ramos extensively. He knows his stuff. Pretty, pretty good. Uh, Ramos is my favorite post-Marcos foreign policy president guy. Despite the mischief riff. Or actually, it, because of how he responded to the mischief riff. Yeah, Ramos is, 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 is the guy I really respect relatively. No? Uh, and he had a bunch of uh, smart guys around him. Pero kulang pa eh. We have to push it. We have to push it. At, uh, I hope we go beyond this kind of independent foreign. You know, rhetorical na ganun. Substance. I want to see substance. I want to see people with relevant background and, and, and you know, people are respected in the foreign policy community getting into top positions in, in, in the government. Uh, yun lang. Uh, but, sorry, I'll control myself. But I say things na, ano na. I think we're, this is the thing with question and answer. Suddenly, wala na tayo sa, ano eh, wala na tayo sa seven years war if ang usapan na natin ngayon. But, but this is what I like about question and answer, right? I hope I kind of answered indirectly at least some of this discussion, yeah. But again, let me just be clear because we have friends from Davao and all. They might, they might think I'm just bashing President Duterte. In fairness, thanks to President Duterte, I think we have much more lively discussions on this. And thanks to the Duterte administration, Duterte administration uh, we have moved in the right direction on certain issues. So for instance, dun sa second horizon modernization natin, dun sa building of uh, upgrading our facilities sa Pagasa, etc. So I'm just trying to say I'm fair. Huh? Hindi ako, hindi ito ano lang. But anyways, that'll be the third lecture. We'll discuss that later on. Thank you, sir, for your um, answer. Uh, naalala ko lang po na na-bring up niyo yung point na yan with the Madam Speaker himself, Representative Gloria Makapagal Arroyo, on your talk. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I had an interview with Madam Arroyo. Actually, the, uh, she's tita of my tito, etc. Um, <laughs> ma- matalino talaga si Mama Arroyo. Uh, I really give it to her. She's really, really smart. Uh, I just don't agree with her foreign policy direction that much. I think Ramos did a better job. But is she smart? Of course she's smart. I mean, I'll give you that. Probably she's the smartest of them all. But that, that, that's not what we were discussing, right? Uh, we uh, what we were di- because in you know, problem kay Arroyo, she was good in uh, giving the Americans the no, but she got a little bit too involved with the Chinese later on, and that kind of backfired, right? That was my Ramos never had that. Ramos was playing his game. He would do karaoke with Jiang Zemin, and then the next day we'll go with Clinton and all. He was doing it well. I like it. Uh, and we'll discuss. Don't worry, we'll discuss it later in detail. No, so ano lang patikim lang yan, yeah. But yeah, thank you for mentioning. Yes, I did interview also Mama Arroyo uh, among others, and I raised this issue. Essentially, I, I told her, is Duterte's foreign policy essentially a copycat of yours? Because she's the de facto advisor of Duterte and foreign policy. And now she's the de facto great statesman engineering the Marcos Duterte. I, know, uh, I don't want to use the word cartel, but, but the, 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 the duo, right? Which, which could become our next ruling, essentially, uh, tandem, right? Um, sir, for you, uh, for our next question, um, it, uh, it came from Bachelor of Arts in History 3.3 from Proceso Celis. Uh, 
Um, how did Filipino guerrillas utilize the disparate, uh, disparate geographical features of the country for warfare? How did they manage communication given the communications at the time? Uh, given the conditions rather at the time, do you think the guerrilla style of warfare will still be effective nowadays considering the advancement in technology? Yeah, again, I, I definitely I'm not a warfare historian, although I love listening to podcasts on warfare. I'm a big fan of ancient history stuff. Uh, you know, I mean, Persian, Greek wars, etc. I don't know. I mean, uh, there is a very great book by Max Boot, right? Uh, actually, I wanted to mention here about this kind of small wars, etc. Uh, and it, one of his arguments was that actually uh, some of the things that happened during the uh, Philippine-American war would be a precursor of the what happens in Vietnam and other places. What, what, what I'm trying to say here is that there are certain fundamental aspects of guerrilla warfare that I think is almost universal. It can apply to all contexts. Uh, and uh, when I say on context, I, I don't mean in the middle of New York, right? What I mean is that in places when you have a specific topography and specific asymmetry of power, it seems guerrilla warfare works and not. But of course, they're counter... I mean... There are also cases where it doesn't work. For instance, look at the Jewish-Roman wars, right? Uh, it didn't work that well against the Romans. Romans eventually decimate. I mean, they were able to, you know, th th that's the tragedy of the Jews, right? Were uh, taken out, so especially the second Jewish-Roman war. So I can give you some examples where it didn't work that much, but there are also a lot of examples where it worked to a certain degree, right? For instance, even in Spartacus' case, for while it worked against the Romans, right? Uh, and, and we also see... In, uh, so in ancient times, even, there sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. So there are many factors that explain it works. It's not, I think technology, my problem with techno files is that they, they try to reduce everything to technology. It's very Mark Zuckerberg, which is completely nonsense. Because let me tell you why I come. So my first book was on Arab uprisings, right? Arab Spring. Uh, I was in Egypt in, in 2010, et cetera. So I, it's, uh, Middle East is a region also I'm very familiar with. I've written academic stuff on that, among others. Um, the thing is, I remember during the first days of Arab Spring, uh, you know, there were people saying, thank you, Facebook, like you made revolution happen, right? And then you have uh, uh, Bonim, uh, Google executive who wrote the book, Revolution 2.0. Not knowing in a few years that very Facebook and Twitter will be used by trolls, by ISIS, by authoritarian regimes, to go after democratic forces. So the thing with technology is that it's a double-edged sword. It depends who work, who uses it and who uses it better. And sometimes the bad guys are better in using it, right? So when we speak about technology, there are aspects of technology or kinds of technology that actually help uh, conventional forces sometimes more, but sometimes it actually can be better utilized by non-conventional forces and non-state actors. Now, going back to the guerrilla issue, if there's a... If I'm going to name one guerrilla force that has been the most successful in contemporary history, you can guess who. They just won over all. In, back in August, they just kicked out a pro-American regime. As you can guess, Taliban. So if you look at the Taliban, they're one of the most moneyed and one of the most successful guerrilla forces in contemporary history. They just decimated the uh, American-funded uh, um, uh, regime. And, and the Americans had a very hard time defeating the Taliban. Now, that doesn't mean that Taliban did not get a help from a neighboring country. We can talk about Pakistan forever, et cetera. But in many ways, Taliban used guerrilla warfare to beat the Americans. And, how, and this is just now. I mean, this is our era. I'm not talking about Vietnam War or something like that. So it depends how you use it. But clearly, uh, our recent history shows that guerrilla warfare works when certain circumstances are there, uh, when there's ideological... Uh, coherence within the group when they're really devoted and uh, so I mean one of the strengths of the Taliban is that they, because they believe so much in their cause they're willing to die they have no problem they'll go all the way how do you beat a guerrilla warfare like that second thing is that they're willing to learn latest techniques and leverage latest technology right and sometimes use latest technology of the conventional forces against them so they're so we can go on forever I'm not a guerrilla warfare expert but all I'm telling you is that from my own basic very basic not hopefully more than shallow understanding is that there is there's some fundamental laws in guerrilla warfare that I think can apply throughout time and space, right? Uh, but of course, you have to have right leadership and some other elements that have to come together, support, of course, by the community, et cetera, and grievances for that to work. And look at the Philippines. 
eh, yung communist rebellion, ilan tagal na, mag six decade na, longest in ano, you know, diba? So, we see that actually guerrilla warfare and and the thing is also urban warfare is is increasingly becoming the next trend. So, with the Battle of Mosul 2014, Battle of Marawi among others, this is the other scary thing that is emerging right now. Kind of like terrorist guerrilla forces get into some relatively large city, hunker down there and Ah, it's a very it's a very hard conflict. Just look at Mosul and Marawi. Grab how hard it was to beat the the terrorist groups, right? By very advanced conventional forces. So yon. So so even the forms of guerrilla warfare are 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 are, are evolving, right? But wait, no, I I hope we're not getting too much away from from our topic. But you know, this is my just two cents as a as a non expert on this issue. Our next question, um, my partner. Um, so we have a question from, uh, from UHTC Shamar Shamar Aoy. So good afternoon, talk from Zaria. Thank you so much for this very interesting lecture. So her question is: You have mentioned earlier that we can acknowledge the influence of the French Revolution to the to the liberalism and eventual rise of revolution in the Philippines. In terms of the big man and patronage in the Philippines, could we acknowledge that it was the influence of the Spanish government or it was based on the 19th century event? Especially many political families will continue to emerge in the, near, in the next years after colonialism. No, uh, uh, the, the French Revolution one is really a big factor. Uh, and some Americans actually describe General Luna Uh, and some of our top uh, illustrado leaders, right, as kind of like versions of uh, Danton and all of these uh, people who were key figures. Uh, so one was all these Jacobin leaders who were involved in France. So parang my counterparts ilang lahat. Eh. I forgot who, who who was General Luna uh, uh, um, exactly compared to, but you can imagine. Uh, you know, it probably Mabini was Maca. And then uh, you know, so you can see who they will uh, compare to. So definitely, the French Revolution was a big, big factor uh, influence, and until today, right? The ideals of the French Revolution, egalité, uh, fraternité, right, equality, all it's, it's still uh, uh, resonating with that. On the question of again, political economy and state building, etc. As I said, I, I think I mentioned that a while ago, right? We see definitely some similarities between Philippines and other. Uh, Latin American countries in terms of our political economy, but actually the Philippines is in a worse shape, politically speaking. So I'll just give you some numbers. So in um, in Argentina, based on some of the data I saw, only five percent, right, of their legislature is dominated by political dynasties. I think Mexico, the number is between 10 to 15 percent. Philippines is between 70 to 90 percent. So if you talk about um, centralization of power uh, and, and power of political dynasties and families, Philippines is even worse than Latin America. A lot of Latin American countries, right? So, so union, union worrying sa akin. But in terms of income inequality, we're slightly better than them, but still among the worst in the world, right? If you look at Gini coefficient, for instance, or concentration of wealth uh, or new growth rate. So I'll just give you another number. Um, so in Philippines, the 40 richest families took home 76% of newly created growth in 2013 per World Bank. So if we had 6% growth, lampas sa 4%, ay pumunta lang sa mga ilang, ilang pamilya lang. The number in Thailand, which is in the middle of a kind of a civil war between red shirt and yellow shirts, the number is around 30%. And in Japan, it's 11%. So we're two times worse than Thailand in terms of concentration growth and three, four, five times worse than Japan. Just to put things into context. So, you know, in some ways, we're actually even worse than the Latin Americans. And I would say there are many factors that contribute to that. I'm already getting out of the topic, but I think the Marcos regime kind is partly responsible for this. Let me give you an example. Uh, so one of the things that people keep on uh, forgetting is that we used to have a two-party system prior to the declaration of martial law, right? Uh, nationalista, liberal, whatever, right? Even Marcos was liberal, the nationalist, you know what I'm saying? Uh, it was not perfect, but it provided the minimums of what you call a party politics. Some distinctions in ideologies, certain degree of party discipline, certain machinery of mobilization, certain predictability and all. Well, Marcos, when he came to power, he demolished that. He superimposed 
a de facto one party system. And that was the case until 1986. So when Marcos was kicked out, the new constitution, which is the 1987 constitution and the new elite behind that constitution that came into power, they didn't have either the incentive or the vision or both in terms of restoring our political systems. The result of that is a system whereby celebrities are the alternatives to political dynasties and sometimes the two intermarry. And sometimes the two are one, a celebrity that creates his own political dynasty and you can name names. This is the tragedy of the Philippines. To give you an example, uh, to give you things, uh, to give you a perspective, neighboring Indonesia is under the presidency of Joko Widodo, who was neither a celebrity nor from a political dynasty. He was just a small and medium enterprise leader from a very small town, Solo, right? But because of the level of competence and inspiration that he brought, first he beat the elite in Jakarta for the governorship. And then he became the president of Indonesia. And now he's in his second term and probably is going to be one of the most powerful Indonesian presidents in, in contemporary history, the kind of changes he brought to his country. Where is our Jokowi? And Indonesia just transitioned to democracy, what, 15 years before someone like Jokowi came in? And Jokowi is the only, only the second directly elected Indonesian president after SPY. Look at the Philippines, my goodness. Look at the kind of people who become our president and, or, or, or contention for president. Either anak ng dictador or anak ng feeling dictador or pa dictador or anak ng dating presidente. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's it's or uh, or or dating general ng anak. Ng, I mean, it's such a limited field. I mean, my goodness, when is this? When are we gonna grow up? And look at our constitution. Walang enabling laws on political dynasties. There's just some motherhood statement there, but there's no enabling law. And and. They left it to a dynastic Congress to pass a law against themselves. Is that a joke? Is that a joke? There should have automatically be an anti-dynasty kind of provisions, enabled provisions in our constitution. For some reason, it didn't happen. Uh, we can guess why. Um, and then those constitution natin, walang anti-defection laws. So if you look at a lot of mature democracies, hindi ka pwede papalit-palit ng party, yung tipong, meron kang, hindi mo nangyari sa elections natin. Meron kang, Regional party, digla alis ka dun sa regional party mo, handwritten pa yung letter, bye, text lang. Sasali ka sa isang party, next day, ikaw nang president ng new party, then the next day, balik ka ulit dun sa dating party. Now, I, mean, I mean, this is worse than a circus. This is worse. I mean, circus, my entertainment. This is worse. This is, this is twisted territory already. And one reason is because, my goodness, wala man tayong anti-defection laws. So the joke that we saw with this substitution maneuver, this mockery, this mockery would not have happened if there were more strict boundaries and guard lists uh, placed by our constitution. But that's not enough. It's not just enough to have laws. You have to have committed presidents and administrations to invest in our party systems, to create state-backed subsidy systems for party building and create a culture of political party. The reason our, we are so personalistic in our politics is because there's no party. There's no real party in the sense of the word. The real parties in this country are actually yung pinaka leftist parties, right? Uh, yung mga pinaka progressive parties. But they're very few and far in between and marginalized. And yung party list system, which used to allow more real political parties to come into power, wala, binaboy. Completely binaboy ng mga, ng mga trapo. Uh, ito yung conversation ng mga, ano, ha, yung mga people in the business. Ha, parang, aba, pag tatako ba ang congressman, uh, gastosin ko, ganito. Pag party list, one-fifth lang, pwede na ako maging party list leader. So parang ano lang eh, party list now is essentially the cheap way for trapos to get into power. Right? So a lot of that, I think, uh, can be traced back. So, that's why we had some counterfactual debates with some of my friends. And one of the things I raised, and you guys are historians, I'm not the historian, like, I, was that what if Marcos didn't declare martial law and then he was succeeded by Nino Aquino or someone in, along that line? Not necessarily the most, I mean, I think the Ninoy that came back to the Philippines in 1982 was a special guy. But the Ninoy of 1970 was, was just another politician, right? Uh, ambitious guy, but of course he transformed. That's why I respect Ninoy. I think definitely he's our hero. I'm proud to have, have someone like him, I can call a fellow Filipino. But even if the other Ninoy, the more typical ambitious politician Ninoy came to power, I think what we would have is that slowly, slowly as our economy improves, 
more middle class comes up, more manufacturing comes up. I think we could have built a more or less, more and more decent version of the imperfect two-party system that Marcos replaced with something worse, right? And that 21 years of Marcos was not really helped, right? And I think in, until now, we're still trying to come out of it. And the tragedy of the Philippines is that after having that disastrous uh, dictatorship, what replaced it was not the kind of proactive democratic regimes that we needed to fix the mess and move forward. I think Chile has done a better job at, than us after the collapse of the Pinochet regime. The leaders that came afterwards did a far better job. So that's why in Chile, there is authoritarian nostalgia, that's true, but there's also very strong leftist progressive movement, right? So look at the elections now in Chile. Ang labanan ngayon, far right and left, center left, progressive guy. You want a, a 35 year old guy can become the next president of Chile. Who, who was whose name is Croatian, right? And he was a student movement leader. Tell me in the Philippines if there's anyone who fits that profile now, who is seriously a contender for top offices in the country, none. So even compared to a lot of Latin American countries who, who also went through dictatorship and juntas and all of that, the 70s, bulk of Latin America went through the kind of martial laws that we went through. Some worse, some, some not as bad. But look at how they came out. A lot of them came out better than us. Right. And unfortunately, that's not the case here in the Philippines. Right. Uh, so I would put the Philippines below Chile, far below Chile, but also below Argentina and more or less on the same level as Brazil, I would say. Right. But the difference with Brazil is that because they have better manufacturing based on us, they have a stronger middle class. Uh, they have a strong party, Trabador, the, the PT party, which is led by Lula. And Lula might still become the next president of Brazil. And definitely you'd rather have a Lula than a Bolsonaro as your president especially in the, in the midst of the mess that they have in Brazil right now. And the Philippines, who's our Lula? Do we have a version of PT? We don't. We don't. Liberal Party is our version? No. No, it's not. Even the Liberal Party don't want to be Liberal Party. Even our, our vice president is not running under Liberal Party. There's nothing such as that. And PT is actually a nationwide massive. It's not a, it's not a leftist, progressive, not marginalized or, or marginal is actually a mainstream party, which could become the next ruling party again. They're not perfect. They have a lot of problems, but definitely they're more progressive than liberal party, right? And definitely they have bigger, far bigger base than some of the leftist progressive parties in the Philippines. We don't even have that. We don't even have a PT in the Philippines. So that tells you about the, 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 the kind of fragility that we have in our democratic institution. How is this relevant to our foreign policy? Because kung sabog yung bansa mo, mas madali kang uh, uh, manipulate ng foreign powers, right? When your presidents and politicians are there because they were corrupt, they made some ugly deals, they're more vulnerable to manipulation by foreign powers. If your leaders were a product, product of strong political party systems and robust electoral uh, mobilization, mas mahirap sila i-manipulate ng foreign powers. So the Philippines is very vulnerable to sharp power operations by foreign powers. But I think we're already getting into the third lecture. Okay, all right. Are there other questions? Um, yes, sir. Uh, there are many questions for you. Um, coming from BA History 3.1, um, um, from Joanna Pia L. Salinas. In his article, Anderson mentioned under his examples of linguistic nationalism, the Philippines failed to create a national language which should be, bo which should be used by both the state and national elite. <clears throat> Both, ent both entities remain using English language as a tool to communicate and so on. This is also evident up until this day. The question is, why does the Philippines fail to do so? Is the influence of the Americans directly affected the, the difficulty of changing our national language to our own? Does the mindset implanted to us that the usage of English language is the basis of intelligence has to do with this failure? Yeah, I mean, oof. This is a very complicated issue. I know uh, uh, historians like Zeus Salazar. Uh, in UP, there's this huge movement about how language, you know, especially in speaking Filipino, is important to creation of a national identity. You know, I think that's true to a certain degree. You no, know? uh, I think that's a that's a factor. And and you know, there are many explanations why we haven't achieved that. You no, know? I think we're more like India. You no, know? because when you go India, uh, Hindi and English are actually the language of just. Some, I mean, especially Hindi is just a language of people towards the north, right? Uh, it's it's not the language of a lot of Indians, right? And in, in India, you you have to either learn local languages or speak English. That's like the neutral ground in between, which is kind of similar to the Philippines, right? 
So if I go to Cebu, I I rather talk English or some people rather talk in English to me than in Tagalog. Even in Baguio, I noticed that, right? Although, of course, I can speak a little bit Ilocano, so I can get away with it. So I noticed sometimes there are more Philippines are more comfortable talking to you in English than in, in Tagalog or Filipino for that matter. And if you look at Filipino, is how many percent Tagalog? 90% or 87%, something like that. So I think, uh, I don't know, there are many factors that come together. Nonetheless, one brutal answer, which of course you can argue against that is that, um, you know, in many, uh, in many countries, uh, lang- a unified language was actually created uh, but very brutally, right? So for instance, what we understand as French today, if I'm not mistaken, is really language of Paris, right? It's not the language of uh, Marseille or other big, or Lille or other big city in France. So that was imposed brutally and through very strong state institutions, right? I mean, at the end of the day, remember Benedict Anderson said, uh, nations are imagined communities, but how does that imagination and sense of community come about? As a political scientist, I'll tell you this, it's the state. So if you have a strong state institution that can inculcate through essentially propaganda, right, which is socialization, education, et cetera, right, you can create a strong sense of of, of national identity. So I think the Philippines, uh, I won't say language per se is the problem. The problem is that we haven't had an inclusive and robust national bureaucracy that can create a common sense of Filipino-ness. You cannot do that in a year or even 10 years, but it will take a generation or two. We never had that done over generations, right? And you know, there's also this, this Tagalog supremacy, right? Which I think is a very inimical to a lot of our friends in Visayas. I can also say for us in the Ilocos region or in Baguio, et cetera, uh, we're not very comfortable with that. So, you know, this is the problem. I think the problem in the Philippines is that uh, tribalism and familialism was never challenged sufficiently by a strong national inclusive state right and there's a huge literature on that how do you how do you deal with that etc i mean for me switzerland is an interesting case because if you look at switzerland it's composed of multiple cantons right the italian the german and the english but there's a national sense of being swiss right and that's not established along ethnic linguistic lines per se but it's established based on civic nationalism so i think what we have lacked is have a credible strong state that creates a sense of Filipino civic nationalism, not around language, not around religion, but around civic values. I think that is what we need because I would raise even a bigger problem in the Philippines. One reason why the Philippines is not a complete nation yet, look at our brothers from the Muslim regions. I don't think a lot of them feel they fully belong. And by the way, I'm not saying this myself. That's what I heard from friends when I go to Marawi, to, to, to Mindanao, et cetera. Because you know our sense of Filipinoness is somehow tied also to our religion, uh, to the majority religion, which is Catholicism. So my sense is uh, the best way for the Philippines to create a coherent sense of na- nation is by emphasizing uh, uh, civic values, shared civic values. And look at our neighbors, Singapore, for instance, right? Uh, if you go to Singapore, like they have like Malay, English, and Chinese, right? So they're very linguistically diverse. But there's a sense of Singaporean nationalism, whether you're Malay Singaporean, Indian Singaporean, or Chinese Singaporean, right? Because you believe in the basic values that Singapore represents, right? To a certain degree, Malaysia also has the same case. So my sense is, instead of following this kind of Germanic or I don't know, more Japanese version of like civic uh, of nationalism around a, a common language per se, why not let's be more like some of our successful neighbors like Singapore, for instance, or lesser degree Malaysia, who embrace the diversity, but by emphasizing shared civic values, try to create a stronger sense of nationhood. You know, medyo kulang sa atin sa Pilipinas. In fact, if it were up to me, I want all, all our, uh, ano, all our, yung mga signs and all, kind of like Singapore, we have English, we have a Filipino, which is more inclusive, not just 90% Tagalog, and Spanish. I re, for me, it's sobrang sayang na nawala yung Spanish heritage natin. I'll give you one reason. I, I am reading translations of Rizal's work in English. I'm not reading the original ones because I don't know Spanish at that level. Isn't it tragic that we cannot even read our own founders' works? We have to read translated versions. That's tragic. I mean, it is ridiculous. Why should 
be in that situation. We should have had some basic Spanish training so that we can read the works of Rizal and all of these people, right? So much of our history is inaccessible to us unless it's translated by what? By Americans and foreigners? This is crazy. This is crazy. So for me, instead of one language, I rather embrace multiplicity of our language, but focus on civic nationalism and shared values and this sense of pride of all Filipinos, despite being whatever you know background, believing in some common uh, national interests and values and all. You know, well, Asaten. And I think our leaders, our presidents have done a terrible job uh, in that, you know, um, by, I mean, just look at our elections. I, I, I'm not going to name names. I mean, you have someone who's a mayor in here and then goes there and says, Bisaya is the blood that runs in my veins. Like, okay, I get it, the mobilization and all, but what, what, what are you trying to say here, right? Or, or solid north or solid south and all of that. I, I understand the mobilization value, but once this guy becomes the president, he's supposed to be the president of solid south or solid north and whatever. I mean, well, how is that going to work, right? How is that going to work? So, Yon, I mean, honestly, I hope there'll be more presidents who come from, uh, you know, diverse backgrounds, group, or even mixed blood people who become the next president so who can say, you know, being Filipino is not solid north, solid south, whatever. It's, it's someone who believes in the Philippine national interest in our future, etc. Let's not forget our national revolutionaries and leaders. A lot of them were mestizo. Before them, even Creoles. Manuel Quezon, how many percentage of him is quote unquote Injo, right? He had a lo lots of Spanish blood in him, but no one can question his Filipino ness, right? So I think you know, you know, you know, must for me, uh, more for more reasonable and, and uh, more inclusive, uh, I think, approach to the question of nationalism. So I'm not 100% for linguistic nationalism in, 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 the, in the sense that we have to have one language and forcing it shove it down every once in a while. I, I kind of don't, don't I, and I just don't think it's doable anymore anyway, right? Maybe you could have done this 18th century, 19th. I just don't think it's going to work anymore, yeah. I'd rather have the Singaporean way of approaching it. Yeah. Maybe two questions, a question or two, yeah. Before I go back, sorry, I'm Yes, sir. Um, this came from Angelica Cardenas of DAH Trito po. So Anderson mentioned that the older the past, the better. How do you think we can have a better understanding of the present when the TikTok generation are no longer interested in reading the history and merely relies on unverified accounts that they see in social media? Yeah, here we are again with, I mean, I, I have big problems with social media, but I, I have big, but I have bigger problems with bashing millennials and now Gen Zs. There's so much, like... For instance, on the issue of authoritarian nostalgia, let me tell you what, you know, ang una ko ibe-blame ay yung mga Gen X. Alam mo yung mga tinatawag na Tito Fortuner? Alam mo yung mga middle class? Ito? Alam mo paano namin ni Marcos? Ganito, ganyan, ganyan, dapat, ganyan, dapat, disiplinado. Sila yun, sila mo yung uh, may pakanan dyan eh. Sa authoritarian nostalgia na doon. You know, so I, I, I really don't like when people, oh, these young people don't know anything, blah, 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 they're just TikTok and all. Punta ka sa Facebook and all, pinaka mga naniwala sa fake news at nag-share ng fake news, I'm sorry, yung mga mas matatanda, laling mga, I'm sorry, yung mga nagsabi na, ganito pa nun ni Marcos, napakaganda, hindi eh, kami, kasi hindi kami pinana, ito yung mga ano eh, yung mga nag-imagine ng past. Kung, mga, kung may imagine communities, ito yung mga re-imagine communities na, Paano ni Marcos, lahat kami may pagkain, may kotse, ganun, tapos tignan mo na naman yung data. just ko na lahat, kawawan ng time na yan. So I'm sorry, I, I, I really get irritated when I hear this bashing of young and all. Nonetheless, yes, social media can be very trashy, right? How do you deal with it? First of all, maybe we do more lectures like that with the youth and all. You know, um, <laughs> and, I, and siguro for educators, people who know better than me about Philippine history, because absolutely I'm not going to pretend to be a Philippine historian, um, should be more engaged online. Uh, Shao Chua, some of our other friends do, do a lot of TikTok. I'm getting into TikTok also, so please feel free to uh, follow me. So no, I don't go on TikTok and dance. I do one minute, three minute explanations, kind of punchy, punchy go. So I, the first TikTok I did was just last week. It got like 60,000 views. I understand that's not much on TikTok, but I'm trying. So what did I do? I tried to make it interesting. So yung blind item ni Tatay Digong pinag-usapan, right? Yung cocaine daw yung isa. So anong ginawa ko? Yung background sound, sounds ko, narcos. And then naka-white ako na white fedora, gano'n. But maganda explanation sa tingin ko at least, di ba? For TikTok. Yeah, nag-click. So my thing is, maybe instead of us 
uh, kind of like poo-pooing and say, ah, wala yan TikTok. Kind of, engage it. Go there. Huwag mo payas sarili mo. Huwag kang mag-tumbling-tumbling. Mag-explainers ka. One minute, two minute, five minute. But make it exciting. Make it engaging. That's what I try to do. Uh, I do what I call meta alive. Facebook live, right? Uh, met. I call it Facebook alive before kasi doon mo malaman kung buhay pa yung isang presidente ganun yung mga Facebook alive. Andiyan pa pala siya. Diba? Now I call it meta alive kasi meta na yung pangalan ng Facebook. Like I checked my analytics, right? I checked my analytics. Uh, more than 50% of people who watch my live videos are actually people 18 to 24, Gen Z, right? Which shows there's a market for... And by the way, my meta lives are like 45 minutes discussions, right? And hindi katulad ng mga ibang vlogger na puro marites at tolits lang mga pinag-usapan. Yeah, may mga, may mga konting ano, humor and all. But we try to discuss serious issues. Like in one of my um, FB Alive, I discuss Max Weber's two lectures on education and vocation and politics as a vocation. And still we got tens of thousands of views, right? So it's doable. We have to engage. But at the same time, of course, you have to pressure social media, parang mga fake news, mga ganun to deal with that. But don't give up. Don't abandon the field. Don't just demean and say walang kwenta yan. Engage. TikTok is still a platform. So learn how to engage. I'm still learning. I'm still new. I just started posting my first video explainer last week. So I still don't know it yet. But I'll try to learn. Because if this is the way to reach out, then so be it. But let me tell you what. We also launched a, a platform, uh, a podcast called Project Pilipinas since two, three months ago. Because studies show people are now interested in two extremes. Either short, sh super short, like TikTok, shorts, mga, real, mga ganon, or long form. Long form ay umuuso na ngayon, lalo dahil may traffic or kung mag-board ka or if, if you're going to gym, you can just listen to one podcast for two, three hours, go. And of course, my inspiration is Joe Rogan. I don't agree with his politics. He has horrible politics for me, but he has brilliant uh, method of discussing issues. Some of his podcasts are four hours. So what I did is I also started doing long form discussion because I can see people are interested. Hindi na naman ako tinulugan. No? Andyan pa rin naman kayo, di ba? Nakikita ko naman, nagre-react pa kayo. So people actually respond to long form discussion. And we interviewed Lord De Vera, for instance, the other time. Ang dami namin pinag-usapan from TikTok to China to Marcos, etc. Two hours. Two hours yung, yung interview namin. Okay naman. People responded, people watch, right? As, or at least some of the, we hope, of course, more. But this is what we do. As we have interviewed Dr. Onda from UP Marine Institute, two hours in, you have an interview. We discuss marine biology, West Philippines, etc. So I think yun din, medyo yun din yung feature, long form and then shorts, both. It's kind of like prose versus poetry. You have to do that. Ang hindi na uso ngayon yung mga traditional media style. Yung mga five minutes on TV, pakiut ka, ganun. I don't think it works as much as it used to be. You have to be more spontaneous, more engaging, more relatable. That's the way forward. And as you notice a while ago, what I keep on saying is that pinag-usapan ko si Quezon in 1930s, but you can see echoes of that today. So you kind of relate it. You make history relatable. You make history alive. Because remember, what is history to us was actually life to other people at one point. Right? Right? And I, I'm not going to go into physics, but maybe we are all coexisting right now in the multiverse, right? Maybe they're not in the, they're, they're, they're in the different world, like a lang. You know, but I'm not going to go into that, right? What I'm saying is that don't approach history as some sort of, a, you know, artifact of the past, museum. It's not. It's alive. It's exciting. Things could have happened in many different directions. So when you explain history, bring it back to life. I think Henra Luna was done well, except very dangerous because... All the PI thing that Henry Luna said, I feeling like he was kidnapped. Anyways, uh, that's a different discussion. Uh, but I think the whole Henry Luna Goyo series is a good start. I, I hope to have more of that. And hopefully in the future, more real historians get involved in, in making this, this, this kind of discussions to make it alive. I remember when I was watching Henry Luna, standing ovation. Puno yung room. Grabe, I've never saw that. And this is a historical, biographical work. So if you make it exciting, engaging, and, and, and relatable, I think we can overcome, not overcome, but mitigate the impact of fake news and all of this garbage that is circulating thanks to the algorithm of these big money-making companies. Okay, yeah, maybe one so, last question if ever, Maren. Yeah, thank you. Yes, po. Uh, for our last question, uh, it came from jo Joshua Villajar Crespo. Uh, 
of Bachelor of Arts in History 3.2. Given that the Republic's revolution's primary aim is, is regime change and not social change, like addressing social inequalities, which is apparent because the revolutionary leaders belonging to the elite make sure that uh, made sure that they maintain their social status. Do you think that the Philippines is not capable of self-rule? That's a very good point. Uh, I, I don't know if I forwarded that to Attorney Joanna uh, or Jung, uh, but I think I cited in some of my works. Uh, Dr. Vicente Rafael has done great stuff on that. Uh, and I think he, he wrote something on Thought Leaders and Rappler, which is they may have been patriotic, but they were definitely not progressive. A lot of these people involved, a lot of them, uh, you know, Aguinaldo, among others, they come from, you know, their own mini versions of dynasties or, you know, they, and their ideas were definitely not egalitarian. So um, maybe they had the fraternité, but the egalité part was not as absorbed by them. So probably they still had this feudalistic stuff and all. That's why there's no assurance that had our revolution uh, succeeded. Let's say General Luna's plan succeeded. They gave the Americans so much bloody nose, right? That the Americans said, you know what? Forget it. Philippines is not worth it. And then the Dutch took Mindanao. And then the British took Palawan, but Luzon will stay under General Luna. But what kind of regime it would have been? See, we can discuss about that. So Nino Aquino, in an article for Foreign Affairs 1960s, kind of raised that issue. And some said that maybe the Philippines was lucky that it was conquered by America. Because first of all, we kept the territories, made sure Dutch and the British don't get other islands. And that at least we had some exposure to liberal politics. Because if Siguro General Luna in President and Aten, and probably it would have been a Republic of Luzon, it wouldn't probably be too different from what we saw under Sukarno, for instance, later on, right? Or some of the other post-colonial leaders in the region. Again, I'm not a historian, so I cannot give a super informed take on the counterfactuals, but that's the reality. Almost a huge number of, of key, le key leaders involved in the Katipuna Revolution uh, you know, are, we're not necessarily the kind of progressive egalitarian guys, you know. So my worry was, I mean, you could not, I, I don't have to worry anymore because it them. But had they succeeded, it's not very clear whether they would have created a, a kind of a uh, system that will bring social justice, land reform, and a lot of things. Not to mention literacy levels were very low during that time, 5% uh, at most, maximum. So there would be huge problems in terms of mobilizing people based on informed public discourse and et cetera. So it would have been potentially also very messy, right? So let's not romanticize also. So thank you for, for mentioning that. But, you know, um, you can also have a multi-phase argument to say, well, the first hurdle is to create an independent government, a regime. For once we have national sovereignty and freedom, the next thing is to create freedom for our citizens, right? You can have a kind of a multi-phase argument. But a lot of times that doesn't happen, right? Vietnam, North Korea, et cetera, they became independent, sure, but freedom for their citizens never came, right? Of course, you have to have both, right? Um, but the Philippine Revolution maybe didn't work or could not have worked in ways we believe it should have worked. Um, but we had other opportunities that we can discuss in other lectures when we had already exposure to egalitarian and more liberal uh, uh, liberal progressive values, and yet for some reason I don't know. Um, it okay, we can discuss that in other lectures and all of that. I mean, even with Marcos, I could have said. I mean, he studied in UP for heaven's sake, right? You're supposed to have some exposure to egalitarian ideas and all of that, and yet look at what kind of leader he turned out to be. Look at a lot of UP graduates. What happens to them when they enter politics? No offense to them, right? I'm not saying this because PUP ang UP I'm just being brutally honest, right? Pudal, uh, talaga I mean, meron tayong already economic oligarchy and political dynasties. Minsan, but yung mga new elite, no? Yung mga yumaman dahil celebrity or yumaman dahil lawyer, professional, successful. Tapos mamaya, when they're in power, and then naman, mag, yung pag-iisip nila, feudal rin. So, I think feudalistic middle class is also a problem in the Philippines. Not, not all middle class, but a lot of, I think, but, but I think our middle class is yet to be the progressive pro-democracy middle class, uh, like the kind of middle class that brought democracy to South Korea, Taiwan, and a lot of more successful mature democracies. Uh, I, I'll put it, I mean, I, let's not, just to give you numbers, Duterte's strongest base as a percentage of the demographic was actually ABC, 
he got a bigger share of ABC than E. And I, I think also D. Uh, and Bombo Marcos, I think now, is the leading candidate of ABC Filipinos. So I think that tells you a lot uh, about a lot of things. No offense to anyone. I'm just saying that's the nature of our middle class. So even some of the middle class were involved in the Katipuna, not really elite elite, no? Um, I'm not sure they had the most egalitarian ideas uh, about things. But of course, you can question me. You can, we can talk about the First Republic, yung, you know, Biak na Baton na Constitution. They were relatively progressive. If I'm not mistaken, parang copy lang siya ng Cuban? Uh, counterpart, yung, was it the Biak na Bato Constitution or something? We can, we can discuss that. I mean, historians can correct me. But some of them were just copy paste yata ng Cuban counterpart or something like that. But So I'm not sure they were really from their heart or studies or something like that. And uh, Nick Joaquin had a lot to say also about Filipino lawyers, especially the ones that came after Mabini. This kind of lawyers who are very lawyerly, but not necessarily looking at the actual uh, functions of governance and how uh, and how to find a proper balance between the ideals of the law and 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 creating a progressive political order on the ground. Again, no offense to our lawyer friends, but I think the, the criticism that Nick Joaquin made of Mabini can also much, very much be applied to a lot of our lawyer politicians nowadays. Yeah. Okay, I'll keep it there. So exactly four o'clock or one minute past. So I hope that covered a lot and I didn't put myself into much trouble. And hopefully, hindi ako blacklist or or, or hopefully you can invite me for other lectures and discussions again. My name is Salama. Thank you very much to Sir Raul. Thank you very much to the History Department, to Mom Joanne, everyone for, for uh, arranging this. Hopefully uh, we'll have even more exciting discussions in the future as we get closer to our contemporary era. My name is Salama. This has been a learning opportunity for me and I learned a lot from her question and answers. Thank you. Um, thank you once more, Sir Haydarian, hey, giving us more insight and clarifying more of our thoughts regarding to the information expounded in today's lecture. So question after question, everything were indeed explained well. Um, in consideration with the time of our um, guests here and also to our um, participants here, um, originally this talk is for um, BA History 3132 and 33 plus, but again, because you stayed here, um, we will be providing an evaluation form to get to give our guests um, certificates of attendance and participation. So please um, watch out um, for that announcement in our Facebook page. All right. So um, may I call on um, um, Attorney Joanna Maria for um, providing us um, in, an insightful message regarding our talk today. Um, Attorney Liao, good afternoon po. It's really hard to ano no. It's really hard to comment after yung last ano last, last comment ni Sir Hey Darian about ano about lawyers. <laughs> but it's a good thing he added politician lawyer. So I'm not a politician. I have no intention of being one. So again, thank you so much Professor Hey Darian for a very exciting talaga a very insightful discussion, very in-depth discussion. And we when we are uh, drafting the guidelines for special visiting lecturer. We really envision this to be a way for us to invite experts in the field and having uh, Professor K. Darian to be part of our department to give lectures to our, ano, talaga this proves na this is a success. Yung aming uh, VSL uh, program is a success. Yung mere, in, ano pa lang, mere, joining of Professor Hidarian. And we look forward to the second and to, to the third lecture. Uh, and dami mong mga binigay na mga bagong ideas, exciting thoughts na talaga alam ko yung mga bata dyan, magkukumahog, magbasa ng mga binanggit mong books so that the, the, the next two lectures mas maging engaging pa yung ating discussion. Although I'm not saying that this is not because kung makikita mo lang ang dami namin questions na mga natanggap, we just have to and eliminate some kasi nga po due to time constraints. So thank you so much, Professor Hey Darian. And uh I'm salamat, ma'am Joanna. Okay. Of course, I, I clarified not all lawyers and definitely <laughs> not non-politician lawyers. It's okay. <laughs> okay, po. Nandito na si Chair Marlon na sa meeting room na. Yes, po. Yes, po. Ayun. Sige po. Uh, can we call in Professor? Agoy-agoy to give us a closing remark. 
Ayan, maraming salamat, no? Maraming salamat, uh, Gab at Angelica, no? To our executive officials headed by our university president, Dr. Manuel M. Muhi. No? Thank you for giving us this opportunity to invite our brilliant speaker this afternoon through the university's special visiting lectureship program. To our college dean, Dr. Raul Roland Sebastian, who has been very supportive for the academic development of both the faculty and students. Maraming salamat din. And of course, to all our faculty and students who joined us this afternoon, thank you so much no, for making this uh, first lecture a fruitful one. On behalf of the Department of History under the College of Social Sciences and Development, we would like to express our sincerest gratitude and appreciation to our distinguished lecturer this afternoon, Professor Richard Didarian. Thank you so much, sir, for accepting our invitation. That was indeed an impressive lecture as usual and as expected. And likewise, and likewise we, uh, we are equally, are equally grateful, grateful that, that, that Attorney Juana Marilio allowed us to assign, us assign her as the co-teacher co of Professor Nidarian, uh, despite, uh, despite, despite her voluminous works, works at the legal office of, office of, uh, the, of uh, the university. Well, uh, Philippine Diplomatic History One, the Philippines and Asia, is a particular course in the curriculum of BA History Program. That is a prerequisite to a more broader course, Philippine Diplomatic History to the Philippines and the world. But this afternoon, our lecturer shared with us the historical background of our relation to the rest of the world, more specifically to Spain, the US, and Japan. This is a significant introductory lesson because it allows us to understand our political conviction. This makes us aware that most of our political leaders would be critic of their loyalty to any of the great powers in the world. This also teaches us to be critical of the turnout of events from the past up to the present time, especially with our external diplomatic relations and foreign policy. With this, we hope to see you all again next time for more lectures and discussions. Maraming salamat at mabuhay tayong lahat. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, so again, once more, thank you for Sir Marlon in presenting his short closing remark for today's program. And also for everyone who had attended for today's lecture here, especially to our professors, to the to also to the students. But this program would not be made possible again once more without the UP College of Social Sciences and Development. And also, it will not be made possible without the help of PUP Department of History and to our um, PUP Samahan ng Magara na Kasaysayan and also to our um, counterpart sections, the History 32 and 333. And for, and for us, us to, to proceed, proceed to our to closing, our closing ceremonies, ceremonies, we will now we will now, um, we will now, we will now uh, 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 um, be, take be part taking part in giving in respect, respect to our, to our institution, institution um, by singing um, beauty hymns.
thank you to our tech team and and please um, wala um, wala po muna para po, para uh, po sa ating photo photo so please open your cups if possible and then right um thank you i will now gather the snippet for our um for everyone who can actually open their own cameras please do as we will have our own Water opportunity for today's lecture program. Right, I'm seeing um, a lot of beautiful and handsome faces here. Okay. Uh, hey, I, I I will now start um gathering pictures um for our first screen. Okay, smile. One, two, three. Second screen po. Uh, lima screens po meron tayo dito. Okay. Um. Save ko lang po. Okay. One, two, three. Okay. On to the next uh, screen, our third screen. All right. Okay. One, two, and three. All right. Fourth screen and fifth screen. Maraming salamat po sa pagdalo at sana po sa lahat ng mga nakasama natin dito ngayon ay makasama po muli namin kayo sa susunod na lektura ni Dr. Richard Vitalia. Um, um, Ma'am Liao, um, we are now giving the floor back to you po. I will now stop the live stream.